just a quick little video that maybe if there's a classroom set up yet, there may not be, but showing what six feet across looks like, or if it's down three feet across in the lower grades, whatever it is, looks like. Um, if there's just one that you could show for each school, that might relieve some concerns. But I know that that's part of the problem is getting in the plexiglass if you're putting in um, partitions and things like that. Uh, but. Thanks, Lindy. Floor and then Jonas. I, I think I, I was just going to reiterate what Brian had said in the in the health and uh, I spent a little bit of time the other day with Michelle because I was not sure the website was live in going back because some people are confused with the old website but that's just an archive but in health and facilities there's a lot of that in uh, and in the newsletter so I, I agree with you uh, Lindy that maybe we could add something uh, there but I think that the newsletters that that direct communication with the principals has had the pictures for 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 the parents. So, um, thanks, Flora. Jonas. Uh, I don't think all of the newsletters have had those pictures, and I just wanted to follow up on what Lindy said uh, that you know because parents are not going to be allowed in the buildings, and you know we parents are accustomed to being able to go in and, you know, experience the rooms where our children spend, you know, so much of their lives, you know, as much imagery, you know, as much video, you know, walking tours, you feel comfortable sharing, you know, about what's in each school, I think will, will have a big impact. Great. Thanks. Um, very good. Uh, are we okay with this then? Should we move on to, uh, oh, Lindy, yes. Um, this is really just a public comment, not necessarily about the planning. I've been around the running errands where I go by the schools quite a bit this week. And since a lot of our tax dollars are being spent fixing up things, the paving project at Berlin looks amazing. And they, you know, when you drive by and see all the big trucks, I think if I had my boys were still five and seven, we would be spending a lot of time hanging out and watching all that truck work going on, but it looks like a really nice project. And today returning from Morrisville, I got to come over the Worcester Hill and Dodie's project is in full on and the siding looks really nice where it's done and the windows look beautiful. I happened to go by Callis, saw some of the front entrance work that's being done. And I just, I think it's nice to recognize that this money that's being spent is really improving the buildings and the um, places where our children and our teachers spend an awful lot of time. Um, just looking at the, because um, Dodie still doesn't have all the siding on, but the wrap and the new windows and thinking about the drafts and how that building was drafty and some rooms, it, it just looks like it's going to be um, a much nicer situation for everybody. That's great, thanks. Chris. Okay, Scott. Yeah. 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 So, um, in light of the multiple comments about um, trying to provide more pictures and videos of the um, schools, um, and in light of the, I think this is going back to what Town said a couple of meetings ago about um, high school students with not enough to do. Um, I believe <laughs> we should um, authorize an expenditure to hire high school, several high school students to do the video work that will then make its way onto the website and relieve the principals and other staff members who are undoubtedly busy with other things from that particular task. So I would, um, I would love to make a motion if it's, if it's advisable at this point or I can hold off until the end. I, I think what we might be able to do, Chris, is just indicate by um, board consensus that uh, we authorize the superintendent to undertake this because the expenditure, he'll have to make sure that it, that it um, fits with the budget. I'm sure Lori will insist. Um, Stephen, look. We're discussing the community forum planning. If we're done discussing community forum planning, could we move on to the next agenda item? 
Quite right. We're quite getting right. distracted Thank and we're going all over the place. I, okay. I'd really like to see if we could stay focused on our agenda and get the work that we need to get done first. Once again, the voice of reason. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think let us, uh, let's hold that uh, thought, Chris, and we'll return to it. Um, I think we'll find an opportunity a little bit later in the agenda where it, um, it won't um, provoke any objection. Um, so if we're ready, Chris? I said thank you. Oh, of course, thanks. Um, okay, uh, 3.2, wellness updates. Um, I think the intention here is to kind of just um, get a quick idea of the um, pulse and uh, temperature of the organization um, yeah. during a period of particular stress. And um, uh, this was Floor's suggestion and thank you Floor for it. I don't know if you have anything to add of, uh, I know Brian, you wanna um, answer this. I don't know, does Floor have anything else? I know uh, this was a, a, a great idea to talk about uh, with our, and I know uh, uh, Principal Fair has worked with our COVID-19 coordinator, uh, Elizabeth Worth, and they do have a presentation about the uh, a wellness of, of students and staff during this time. And I think it's uh, very important uh, to hear, hear, what, hear this presentation, so. Thank you, I, I, I don't have anything. I just wanna make sure that that initiative that you guys had for self-care is still going on. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, and and uh, and I and I will say that Principal Fair is uh, also on the um, uh, on the task force of social emotional learning. So this is some of the work that they've been working on. I'll let her. I don't want to take away any thunder from. Uh, she's been working on this on this presentation very uh, very uh, hard uh, the last few days. So, uh, Mrs. Fair, are you there? No one calls me Mrs. Fair. Uh, like, no. That's my mother. <laughs> yeah. You can call me Miss Cat. Miss Cat. Um, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Elizabeth, for helping um, me sort of direct the, the presentation. I'm, I did put something together. Um, it's a little more formal than I would normally do, but I think that, that a visual is really helpful for folks instead of me just sort of talking at them. And I'm wondering, I think Keith McMartin is on here and said he was willing to sort of share the screen. Um, and put my presentation up. This is a slideshow. It's only 16 slides. It shouldn't take too terribly long. But because I will miss you, we're not in person, I won't be able to see your faces or expression. I'm gonna ask you to just try to keep track if you have any questions or thoughts or um, concerns even to try and keep track of them so that we can, I can answer them at the end since I can't see your faces when you raise your hand. Is that okay? Keith, do you mind putting up the presentation? Sure, one minute and I'll get it set up here. Thank you. While um, Keith is getting it set up, I will I will start out by um, acknowledging that um, I, the bulk of what I'm about to share with you is really um, not something that our task force is working on alone. We have stakeholders from all over the state and even across the country that have been working to think about the emotional safety in addition to physical safety for folks returning to school in the fall. And um, the resources, the guiding documents that we've been using um, come from ASCA, that's the American School Counselor Association, and VIDSCA, the Vermont School Counselor Association. And what you'll see on the screen there is everything that's in green, that is um, a link to another document. So I'd love to make this presentation after we're done this evening available on the website. Um, and I'm happy to mail it to folks in the community and, in the, and to the board as well. Um, I also have to say big props to Lisa LaPlante. She's, I'm getting all the, the kudos tonight by having put this together. It's really Lisa, she's amazing. We're so lucky we have her. Um, so what I wanted to start out by saying was addressing the academic skills gap remains an important objective. However, students will not be ready to engage in formal learning until they feel physically and psychologically safe. Establishing that sense of safety may take weeks or even months, depending on the evolving context in individual communities and a range of factors unique to each individual. Even within a school community, individual students and staff may be continuing to experience different stressors that could affect their personal sense of safety. 
as I said, um, as I said in the, with the last slide, this presentation you'll see a work of a number of stakeholders in uh, school counseling and education from all around the state. Um, I think it's really important to recognize those resources that we've pulled from so that you know we're not just sort of pulling it out of the hat, it's, it's steeped in best practice. And, um, and the work of the of its the Vermont School Counselor Association, ASCA, um, NAS, but there's a lot of acronyms, I hope that's okay, National School Psychologist Association. It also reflects the work from Dave Melnick's planning on end well, plan well, and be begin well document. It's important for us to acknowledge the, the role that he has played in the work that we have done in Washington Central over the last two years around trauma-informed and trauma-transformed systems. Um, we, I, we also pulled from quite a few resources from CASEL, which is the resource we are using to drive the work on SEL curriculums. And I just want to acknowledge with these names, if you take a look at it, our task force in Washington Central is comprised of folks from each of our buildings in a variety of roles and is focused on what these supports will look like in Washington Central. While much uncertainty surrounds how and when schools will reopen, we know that social and emotional learning will be critical to re-engaging students, supporting adults, rebuilding relationships, and creating a foundation for academic learning. This unprecedented shift to a new type of learning experience may have a lasting and profound impact on young people's academic, social, emotional, and their life outcomes. School leaders will need to bring together administrators, teachers, school staff, families, youth, and community partners to co-create supportive learning environments where all students and adults can enhance their social and emotional competencies, feel a sense of belonging, heal, and thrive. Educators in this moment of transition have an opportunity to reflect, innovate, and build on an evidence-based practices in schools across the country. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored SEL as an essential part of high quality education, highlighting our relationships, resiliency, and collective problem solving is fundamental to teaching and learning. While nearly everyone has faced some disruption, we must acknowledge the complex varying ways individuals have experienced these months. The pandemic has exposed and exacerbated existing inequities in education, and it's emphasized the need for learning environments that welcome and support all students, including those who were not not equitably served even before COVID-19. Washington Central has established five task forces as we plan for re-entry and the SEL task force is focused solely on integrating SEL and academic supports, creating and maintaining a caring, safe and supportive environment for all students and adults. This fall, we should expect some regression in academic, emotional, and social areas and recognize that some students and families will not disclose that stress or challenges. It's also important to consider the impact of masks on the ability to read emotions and facial expressions, follow speech, participate in speech-related interventions, and generally participate and focus on academics. SEL screenings should have purpose, identifying how the data will be analyzed and used, SEL curriculum should be embedded into core academic areas. And our task force has scripted some back to school interviews for students, staff, and families. We will use this data as part of our system of support to identify where resources and interventions are more urgent. This is a really important point right here because all humans have been impacted in some way during this pandemic. And this team is focused on utilizing the best practices to identify where the impact is most critical or in urgent need of intervention. Our team, along with all of our task forces, are building professional development for the coming year and in service. This PD should try to build from some of the unique learning experiences students may have had at home, while also acknowledging the potential loss that may be related to sports, performances, graduation, or canceled travel. In elementary school, this might look like supporting students in developing relationship building and conflict resolution skills by helping them to co-create shared agreements for their new class or their distance learning environment. In middle school, it could look like offering adolescents an opportunity to reconnect and create a sense of closure from the previous school year. 
excuse me, and in high school providing older students with a way to reflect and um, document their experience and what they've learned about themselves during the pandemic, either through journal writing, their artwork, music, or other creative outlets. It will be important to intentionally build structures that promote supportive adult student relationships and a sense of belonging. We need to ensure every student has at least one caring adult at the school who checks in regularly with them and whom they can reach out to. We should also examine our daily schedules or class assignments to create greater opportunities for meaningful teacher-student relationships. Examples include minimizing the number of transitions between teachers and classrooms, creating or extending time in homeroom or advisory classes and looping students with the same teachers and peers from the previous year wherever possible. If distance learning continues, identify routines to maintain or deepen connections virtually or over the phone, such as through smaller group meetings or individual check-ins. Recognizing that new structures will most likely be in place, creating a consistent routine and procedures that, fall, that allow for flexibility as much as possible. Our team is planning professional development for staff, as I've mentioned, that is trauma-informed, focused on self-care and a deep understanding of the relationship between the brain and the body on how we metabolize and cope with stressors. Our focus is intentionally on supporting staff. Guided by the SEL reentry plans of the Vermont School Counselor Association and Dave Melnick's uh, work, we will be taking a systemic approach to ensuring social and emotional wellness for of our students and families. Knowing that students look to the adults in their lives for strength and support, we will start by making sure our staff members are ready and prepared to deal with the myriad issues that students and their families may be dealing with as school resumes, be it in person or remote. To this end, the SEL task force is designing screener activities and implementing supports for Washington Central faculty and staff, and we're planning pre-service professional development days prior to the start of school. We believe that infusing support and processing into our first staff days back together will serve as the guidepost and modeling for the upcoming days when student will return to their schools. This process of screening and responding to current events will serve as the foundation for the SAL practices as we return to school. Our team has also been working on how to identify support for students who are struggling. While not all students have the same experiences, some students have experienced grief, anxiety, or trauma that may shape how they engage academically, socially, emotionally, or behaviorally. Our plans include how to support staff in proactively identifying and meeting the needs of students who may be struggling, working with family and community partners to create a comprehensive plan, which may include providing additional mental health and trauma supports or connections to food, shelter, technology, transportation, and monitoring the response to ensure needs are met. So really that's three major components, identifying the needs, um, connecting them with supports and interventions, and then monitoring their response to those interventions to ensure that all those needs are getting met. Clear evidence and understanding of the safety, the physical safety measures reinforces psychological safety, which is critical to overall safety. Our students, staff and families need a sense of both physical and emotional safety. The topic of reentry to schools is complex and it's emotionally charged. The SEL task force has worked in conjunction with some of our other task forces where there are implications for emotional safety. I have a few examples of some places where we've worked with some of the other task forces. We've worked with the health and facilities team in um, planning scripts for how to ask for space when someone gets too close. You, you, you can imagine that's going to look different with, for a little, you know, a six, you know, six-year-old in first grade saying, get away from me, right? There's gotta be a way to teach them, give them a script for how to ask for space that it ensures their safety and to give all, make it normalized enough for the, to, for the other kiddo to be able to receive that information because to, to hear to get away from me can, can also do some damage. So we're really working on that. Um, we've started to talk a little bit with our curriculum instruction and assessment team about how to prioritize social emotional health and learning when we also really, really wanna focus on the academic growth. And we touched base uh, most recently with the logistics task force about um, the 
the safety drills that we need to conduct, they're still mandated, we're still required to do them each month, and what might those implications be? How might we plan for it to ensure the emotional safety if we're saying maintain physical distance, but we're gonna have a lockdown drill. So let's curl up really tight and be quiet and breathe each other's air, right? We, we're gonna, this is, this is the work we're faced with. It will be important to collect and act on the data around students who are disengaged or chronically absent. And again, like the, the drills, we need to keep in mind that the truancy laws have not changed and schools are still held accountable for them. One of the most critical tasks during the transition to the new school year will be supporting each student, particularly those whose needs were not fully met before COVID-19. For students who have not regularly attended classes, we need to develop a plan that addresses the root causes of their absences and leverage family and community partners to double down on individual outreach and relationship building. This may include revising existing policies and procedures that may have been inequitable or detrimental impact on students, such as punitive or exclusionary discipline discipline practices that can contribute to student disengagement and re-traumatize students. The SEL team is also planning elements of uh, self-care and trauma-informed approaches and restorative practices for PD during pre-service. Attuned to the social and emotional needs of all the adults responsible for supporting students' learning and development, the stress and well being of teachers, principals, and staff are not new concerns, but the disruptions caused by COVID 19 have added to the educators' anxiety and worry and stress. In a survey by Castle, that was the resource I mentioned at the beginning, and the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence in late March. Um, they surveyed thousands of teachers that described their most frequent emotions during COVID-19 as anxious, fearful, worried, overwhelmed, and sad. And they cited the stress of adapting to virtual classrooms and working from home while caring for their loved ones. By creating time, space, and working conditions and a supportive work culture that help adults feel connected, empowered, supported, and valued, school leaders can help cultivate adults SEL competencies and overall, overall, overall well-being. We've talked a lot about this one tonight um, and it will more to come as this evolves, but our website, our newsletters and community forums are critical components to engaging and communicating with our families. While some of our guidance limits or prohibits activities that bring non-essential adults and families into the building, it doesn't mean we cannot hold on to our traditions and rituals like open house, meet the TA nights, meet the teacher, just like graduation like June, it, last June, we need to think creatively about how to offer these traditions like open house in the fall in new ways that are both safe and special. Resilience is fostered by and enhanced most effectively by a facilitative environment. It is far more effective to change the environment than to focus on changing an individual person. Change the environment, control the context, and people change for the better. Our school counselors, multidisciplinary teams, community partners, and families are critical to creating a comprehensive plan for an emotionally safer return to school. Planning for the unexpected. Planning for the unexpected and being flexible and responsible, responsive has become the norm. In this age where we are expected to plan for school closure, dismissal, remote learning and reopening schools with little or ever changing guidance, mindset is the key. Nothing in this life comes without risk and we are not able to control whether or not we are in the midst of a pandemic. When the situation you find yourself in cannot be changed, the only thing you have control over is how you choose to let it affect you. This is mindset. We need to be open to engaging in what is meaningful, look for the opportunities embedded in what we have learned about ourselves during this time, and embrace the humor and joy all around us. It is there when we need to choose to see it. The coming months will mark continued transitions for everyone in school, communities as they prepare for an academic year that offers new types of relationships, learning, and operations. The transition may bring excitement, anxiety, concern, and other complex emotions as students wonder 
what the return to classrooms will look like, anticipate reconnecting with peers and teachers, and look forward to engaging in person in supportive learning environments. This moment will call upon educators to intentionally and relentlessly for emotional and physical safety and a sense of belonging throughout their school community. High quality SEL implementation provides students and adults an opportunity to continue cultivating critical skills such as empathy and compassion, self-regulation, stress management, communication, collaboration that they will need not only to manage their experiences during the pandemic, but also to be the caring contributing members of their community that we wish them to be. SEL can also help educators reflect on how this experience has shaped our understanding of what and how we teach in schools, as well as the conditions that fully and equitably support student learning. I, that's, that was my last slide. I, I do want to point out a couple of things as I was talking, um, and Keith, you can take it off shared screen so I can see everyone's faces. Um, and thank you for doing the, the slides for me, Keith. Uh, one of the, the things that I was thinking about as I was talking is a couple of things. One that I heard in town's voice in the room around what students are, are nervous about, excited about, looking forward to, that need for reconnecting. Also, Chris's call for let's talk about this and reframe what we're doing in terms of what we've accomplished and not just what is a plan. So um, look for our next update to say what we've already established for our PD for the fall for, for staff. Um, we have accomplished a lot and I think it's important that we, we change our language and our voice to match that. Any thoughts or questions for me? I know I just did a lot of talking at you and it was sort of a serious tone when I got to this slide on planning for the unexpected. I had a kind of funny little video I wanted to show you. And then I thought, hmm, it might not be the right mood. <laughs> um, but if anyone wants to see a funny video later, I'll share. Stephen, I'm not gonna do it right now because I know you want us to stay on task. Uh, Floor, did you have a question for me or for the group? Is Maybe if you could make this presentation, do the summarized version of this presentation for our public forum. I think it would be. Can I have a microphone? You know I love one. Uh, you, I'm kidding. Can you hear me? No. Yeah. yeah. It was a joke. It was yeah. a joke. Oh, sorry. Um, I was like, <laughs> I was like <laughs> sorry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. This, this was very much like asking for a hamburger and then being served a sirloin steak. Um, oh, good. Is that good? It wasn't too I, long? It, 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 was, it was very, very good to hear and to hear through um, what you were saying that uh, basically um, you're holding it together, <laughs> it seems, um, under, uh, under tremendous pressure. Uh, Brian. Yeah, and I, and I just wanted to uh, thank Kat and Elizabeth and the entire SEL task force because uh, that, that's uh, been some of the things that they've been looking at and uh, considering how do we prepare for the start of school when children have been, as I know, I know town uh, did bring this up already, but you know, the, 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 all the contrasting fears that children are facing uh, by being home for these last five months. And I also think that uh, the adults, uh, parents, our teachers, our staff, uh, it's very, it's a very challenging time, uh, and I know there's a, a lot of anxiety and fear. And you know, I get, I get questions a lot from staff and uh, from families about what, what it's going to look like. And we keep trying to, it's like a, again, it's like an onion. We keep trying to peel the layer off and get, get closer and closer to the core. Uh, and then the next day we get new guidance, or we get a new directive, and we, or we find out we can't do something because we don't have the personnel. And we have to go back and, and uh, we look at it. So, so I so I know that uh, you know it's it's definitely challenging and it's frustrating and uh, and, and and I want to let the parents and families and, and staff know that uh, we are definitely working as hard as we possibly can to make sure that everyone is safe. That is the number one thing. And I know uh, some of the other recent uh, comments and uh, that I've received from staff and teachers and things that I've been hearing out in the community. It, uh, I, you know, how do how do we prepare for this? You know, it's great to hear Cat. It's great to hear from the SEL task force. Uh, but what is that going to look like when I get back to school? What am I going to What am I supposed to do? And uh, one of the things is is uh, we the leadership team. Uh, we're meeting again tomorrow. We we, we meet a lot. We're, we're constantly talking about these uh, things. One of the things uh, that we're looking at is the uh, district's calendar for the year. Uh, I know we, you know this, the uh, governor made it pretty easy with the students uh, coming back on September 8th, but 
but when do when is the first official day for teachers and staff? And so, you know, we're we're looking at a, a first day of August 24th and front loading a lot of our uh, professional development days in the beginning of the year to really train our faculty uh, and get ready for you know the beginning of year. So we're looking at possibly 10 professional development days right at the start of the year. Uh, so a lot of these things that uh, Kat Fair uh, mentioned in her <laughs> presentation uh, is, um, it, and, and many other things, training teachers around the new, uh, the new Canvas, uh, the new uh, learning management system, how to, how to use the online system, training everyone, because in three weeks after school starts, or, or one day after school start, or the day of school, we could go all remote if the, if the governor and the uh, agency of education, things change on the ground, we have to be flexible. So how do we build some of that flexibility into training our staff and preparing them, uh, training them around protocols and cleaning and disinfecting protocols in the schools. We, I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm sidetracking away from my, I know uh, uh, Kat had that some, some, one of the disinfecting protocols mentioned in her, in her uh, slide, but, but I think, uh, you know, getting those things uh, and ready for t uh, teachers and staff to understand that we are looking at those pieces. And uh, when you come, when if the first day is August 24th, which is what we're looking at, uh, again, we have to work some certain things out uh, before, you know, the leadership team needs to work a couple things out. We also would like to meet with the uh, Labor Management Council of the, uh, the unions uh, to make sure that they're aware of uh, what, we're, what we're proposing. So uh, when we um, next meet, uh, we have a real clear solid calendar but uh, the, the calendar really you know tentatively is what we're thinking about is the first day would be august 24th uh for uh, staff uh and we're tr trying to work out the in-service days the student days and uh the days also for our esp so we're still at, we're, we're almost there we're not there yet uh, but uh we're getting very close and we should have an update hopefully out there soon but again wanted to let the school board know that our board, we our our team has been looking at this, and very importantly, um, if there's some teachers and staff that are out there, we are looking at this, and we are building in um, planning uh, around returning for, for a safe return to school and trying to address uh, some of the uh, questions that folks have been raising regarding what is this going to look like? What am I supposed to do when kids show up on the first day? What's it, what am I how am I supposed to uh, respond? Uh, one of the things that we are looking at is the first uh, month of school. Um, we're looking at, it, it's gonna be a lot, it's gonna be a very, uh, I don't wanna say traumatic experience coming back, but it's gonna be very, I mean, kids, kids haven't been to school in five months. So just getting them used to going to school. Uh, and that, so I think even though the first, you know, in the beginning, yes, we're gonna be very, we're gonna have academics and everything else. I think we're also gonna be really looking at that social emotional piece and what does that look like in the schools? And so, uh, because that's going to be the most important piece. I know, uh, not to sound like a, uh, a geek with the research, pointing the research out, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Uh, if you, you know, it's very hard to impact here when you you really need to feel a connection uh, here in in your heart and uh, and with the people that you're working with. So I know that's uh, that's one of the challenges we're facing. And I think the first 30 days of school, yes, things will be academic. Uh, at the same time, we're really going to be working trying to re-acquaint uh, ourselves with school for both for our adults and for our uh, students. Thank you, Brian. I'm, um, I'm going to make a suggestion because much of this uh, connects and overlaps with what we'll be getting to in 4.1. If board members have burning questions that are generated by Kat's presentation just now, if you could please maybe hold them and uh, we'll have an opportunity to incorporate them into our part of um, 4.1.2. Um, we still have miles to go before we sleep. So um, if, if there's no objection, we can um, move on to 3.3. Um, I, I trust there's no objection. Thank you. Um, business administrator succession. What this means is that um, we have enormous shoes that need filling. And um, this will take some thought uh, and preparation. Um, Brian, is this one that you would like to uh, lead off on? Uh, yes, uh, I, I know uh, we're uh, gonna have, uh, this, this, is our, I, this is my first year as superintendent and I know this is uh, Lori Bubo's last 
year. I hope that's not, <laughs> I hope she didn't decide to leave because I don't know. Just kidding, Lori, but uh, uh, Lori's retiring at the end of the year and uh, she's been here since 1985, I believe. Uh, and it, it's very hard to, you know, you never really replace someone who's been there that long, uh, uh, who's been uh, so dedicated to the supervisory union and now the school district. Uh, and I know we're just, we, we just became a school district very recently, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, changes, a lot of things that need to be done. Uh, and uh, one of the things is how do we have a good succession policy? And, uh, you know, Lori and I had spoken about it and uh, I know what we're, we want to definitely, you know, look for someone and recruit someone and possibly get them in there sooner rather than later so they can come in and really start getting acquainted with the entire process uh, of, our, of our school district, uh, of uh, how, we, how, we, how things have happened and, and, done, and been done. And so we're looking at, when would be a good time to do a posting? Uh, should the posting uh, be not just in Vermont, but also a national uh, posting? Uh, because uh, I, I have to say, full disclosure, business administrators do not grow on trees. You don't, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, I, I don't know, the, I, I don't wanna you know, get myself in trouble, but I, I had never met a child uh, when I ask them what they want to be, what they want to do when they grow up, they, I've never heard a student say, "I want to be a school business administrator." So uh, it's very, uh, it's it's very difficult to find a really good uh, uh, replacement. And uh, so I don't know if Lori has anything else she would like to add, but I know that uh, it would be important for our district to think about posting for a position and thinking about you know putting together a committee and interviewing and you know getting that going sometime in the next few or several weeks. Lori, do you have anything to add? <laughs> it's really at the board's purview. I mean, I gave a long notice um, thinking it would provide the opportunity for the board to do a thorough search and for them to, um, I haven't been here since 1985, it was 95, oh, okay. 94, 90, fiscal year 95, 94, yeah, I was at Central Vermont Hospital then, so, um, okay. but honestly, it's really the board's purview, I mean, when I came here, there was a committee set up of board members and, you know, a wide range, just kind of like you did for the superintendent search, but I guess it's really at the board's discretion on how they want to do the search and, and what you want me to participate in and what you don't because honestly you might just want a fresh set of eyes so that was all I had to say great thank you Laurie thank you Brian um board members what say you to this idea of getting started soon and casting the net broadly Jill I would say soon and cast the net broadly absolutely I think that's right Others? Stephen. I think it would be beneficial to decide when we want to have the person hired and how much overlap we want. And then that'll form inform when we're going to start to search, when we're going to form the committee. So, I mean, do we want uh, a six month overlap? Do we want a one month overlap? Do we want a nine month overlap? Um, for me, uh, the board saying, this is what we want. This is when we want to hire someone so they can spend this much time working with Lori, then informs most of the other work that has to happen. So I, I, I'll ju I, just to start a conversation, I'll uh, say I'd like a hire for a three month overlap at a minimum. Three months at a minimum. Uh, uh, Flora and then Lindy. Yeah, I, I agree with what Steven said. And I would just add to that, that maybe Lori could help us to start with, with uh, a updated job description of what is, because some of those are a little old in our files and things have changed and, you know, so it, that, would, that would be great. That also would give us a perspective on what, how much time, and I would go for more than three months, but yeah, three sounds good. Thanks, um, Lindy, and then Chris, and then Jonathan. Um, I, I don't think more than three is necessary for one thing, um, financially. We've been approving an awful lot of stuff that is making me very nervous about COVID. 
as far as I don't see our sister districts buying some of the things we're buying. And I think an overlap, you're paying the person at the salary you're promising them. So uh, we don't do it with any other positions. If we have a system in place that's good, which I have full faith we do because of Lori's work in the past 20 plus years, um, an overlap, especially those last three months, which is closing out the books and starting up the new year would give a great introduction. And I think the um, VASBO would probably be helpful in identifying people when we advertise. Um, there may be other districts who have people in great training who would find our district very, um, pers you know, a good place to work. We have a good reputation across the state. So I'm not saying don't cast it out wide at all but I do not agree with like a six month or nine month overlap because of financial. And I don't think it's really that necessary. Thanks, Lindy. Chris and then Jonathan. Um, so I, I would support a three month um, overlap at a minimum, um, just because um, the business manager, I think is probably um, as crucial a position um, as a superintendent. Um, because of the finances involved. Um, the, in terms of a search, um, I have no problem with a, a broader search and just to have more candidates in the door. Um, but I would also urge that we have um, someone on the search committee. Um, you know, I would hope Lori would be on it, but also another financial person um, be on the search committee because those are the folks who would know what questions to ask and be able to talk the talk with the business manager as opposed to board members um, uh, in terms of the finances. I'm, I'm not aware of any of us being um, particularly imbued with financial wizardry um, or experience um, beyond our, our own household or personal finances. Um, if there are, I apologize and I'd be, love to have you on the committee, um, but I think it's a very important position and we should not under under train or under um, undersell what we need for it. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Jonathan. Yeah, I would just like to add to that. Um, I, I, I agree with some of the sentiments already shared, which is that it is a highly, highly specialized position. And I think at, at a minimum three months of training uh, and if, and to the extent that Lori would be willing to, to help out beyond and uh, to, to whatever extent that, that she um, is willing to train the new person whenever that person is, is selected. I think that's invaluable. Um, she, she knows the, the ins and outs of, of our budgeting process better than anyone. And, uh, and so I, I think that, that her, her knowledge is really invaluable in, in, that, in that way. So that's what I just wanted to share. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, other board members, Dorothy. Um, well, I, I'd, I'd like to ask Lori what she thinks would be a good time frame, um, keeping in mind that if we do it the last three months that she's here, that's the, the end of the year. It's a wicked busy time. Um, maybe we need four. I, I'd just like to find out how she feels about that. Uh, agreed, Lori. Okay. Um, honestly, I think that that is the better time of the year because things are a little bit slower, unlike this year when we had COVID. Um, the thing that um, you might want to consider is similar to teachers. A lot of business administrators make decisions to sign contracts um, in the spring. So you probably would want to make a decision around February at the latest so that people could plan for that, whether or not you had them start and cross over isn't as important as um, having them be available to sign a contract with a new district. You may also encounter other people. I came to this job from the hospital and um, it was a nice switch for me. It was a lot of similar in the financial skill set that I needed. Um, the other pieces, people from the state of Vermont might also apply. 
So you might end up finding that you have people who aren't necessarily business administrators applying. They might be coming from different walks of life with similar nonprofit experience. Thank you very much. So um, what it sounds to me as though the, um, the hiring process and the hiring timetable for um, a successor to Lori will follow roughly the same um, calendar as for hiring Brian last year. Is that, is that about right, Lori? That's, that's if you wanted someone to cross over for three months, yes. Right, okay. Um, is, that, uh, is that the board's consensus? Three month, um, three month crossover, overlap? Yeah, Lindy, sorry. I think something Lori pointed out, if it's not from another uh, profession, another accountant type profession, they may not be able to cross over because they will be in a contract with a school district, but perhaps they'll have some leave time that they can pop in and out to work with Lori. And if that's the best candidate, I think we have to also think about that as well. Um, but there may be somebody from nonprofit or hospitals or um, other places that have that kind of financial background uh, running budgets is something a lot of people do. They may not be school budgets, but they've run budgets. So um, keeping our options open is important, but realizing if it's another school business administrator, they may already be contracted through June. Thank you, Lindy. Flora? And I think that hiring committee should be more than board members, right? Like it was mentioned, also members of the public. And, and we have some previous board members that have experience on numbers too. So it should be a similar committee that what we use for Brian, not that committee, but something that has community members, principals, and uh, a Brian who's going to be working directly with the person and, uh, and board members. Yes, fortunately, this is not um, this is not uh, a decision that we need to make right away. Um, but uh, but thank you. Um, so what what then would be the next step? We have uh, we we would draft up a uh, uh, an announcement, um, an advert, um, based on your job description. I imagine, Lori, correct. So um, perhaps if uh, we could see, um, I, I know this is this is not um, this is happening at a at a time when everything else is happening, but perhaps around September or so, um, if there were a draft, um, that might help. Um, Flora and then Lindy. One one thing that we could decide is that are we going to use a consultant? Are we going to do this in-house? Would we ask Jen for help to do this? Are we going to do it in-house? So that that job description, you know, you need that committee first. So so we should decide on, we don't need to decide on the process today. We can talk about it at our next meeting or or have something to present to the board from, from Brian and the agenda planning committee. I don't know, something to, so that the board can 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 make some some decisions because I think we were gonna want somebody to be vetting those candidates anywhere anyway, so that might be the first decision. Thanks, Laura. Um, Lindy, I think um, I was just going to say it just needs to go down as a future agenda item. I think the opening of school and COVID is pressing. This would be more like in November and perhaps the vetting of those applications could be the admin team right at central office um, versus an outside consultant. I don't think that's usually used for a business a business administrator, whatever they're called. Um, so I think we need to just put this down as a future agenda item because I think our focus needs to be on getting the school started and the safety of all of the things that the public and the teachers are so concerned about right now. That, 
that sounds like sage advice to me. Um, are, are there any objections to that from board members? If we put it on the future agenda list and, um, and we'll just keep it uh, on the shelf until we're ready to bring it down and get cracking. All right, great. Thank you, everyone. So now, um, if there's no objection, we move to 3.4 board retreat. Um, Floor, would you like to? So, sure. We we had a meeting with the with Nick with the facilitator on uh, last Tuesday. Uh, Scott, Brian, and and myself and Michelle joined us and took some some minutes too. It, we at the moment the most pressing need, and I'll let Brian speak more to the substance if necessary for right now. But uh, our most pressing is to set the date. Uh, and Jonathan, since I have you there, I sent you an email just to double check, but we're, uh, we're thinking September 12th is where we have the most people. Uh, Lindy is able to join us that day now, and I was waiting for Jonathan, are you hearing me, Jonathan, that they will work for you. But if we could hold that date for the meeting seems to be the one that everybody can, can make happen, except for Stephen too. And I also sent you an email, Stephen, to see if by any chance that had change for you. That's fine for me, Flora. This is Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Steven? Uh, it sounds like most people will do it. I, I'll see what I can do. Flora, can you just remind me to say the date again? I just want to be sure it's on my calendar. September 12th. It's a Saturday okay. and it's yes. breakfast and lunch. And it was, it was in, yeah. And your doodle poll said yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, no, yes, it, yes. I, I can do it, but I didn't block it on my calendar. So I want to do that. So I don't fill it in by accident. And now, thank you. Know, considering where we are in agenda, I think that unless you have more to share, Brian, it, it was a, a really good meeting. We, we, don't have a, we don't have a location yet. We're, we're still planning. So I think considering where we are in our list of things to do tonight, if you're okay, we'll report back in our next meeting and keep going down our lengthy agenda in the hopes that we'll get done earlier, unless you have some specific questions. Uh, so uh, I think if, if it's September 12th and we're gonna hold that date, uh, I just we just have to let the facilitator know as well. So he's a he, I know he's available, but we just want to make sure. So I can do that tomorrow and let him know, and and we can continue the conversation about the location and other pieces that we'll need to figure out. Great, thank you, Brian. Thank you. Good. So um, if you're ready, then we can move on to three point five, the Career Center Regional Advisory Board representative. Um, Brian, would you like to yeah. introduce this? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm going to turn this over to Floor. Uh, I know uh, basically uh, that we have an advisory board representative, and I know uh, Floor. I, I'm learning the history here. Used to, is is one of the representatives, and then I think there was an alternate, but uh, that alternate is no longer on the uh, school board, and so we need to uh, figure out. Uh, it, it, uh, first is do we Flora? Do you still want to be on it? Is that I think it's a. It's, yeah. I, I'll turn it over to you, Flora. <laughs> yeah, so, so I was appointed. This is the uh, you know we 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 sit at the at the uh, technical board with uh, Brian and uh, at, at that point was Deborah and myself and Marilyn had been uh, my alternate. In uh, she had needed to attend any meeting, but it would just for just in case, I think it would be good. And uh, it, Penny asked us to see if we could nominate, since she won't be there, her, if we could nominate an alternate. I, I'm still planning on attending the meetings. Uh, we haven't met uh, since COVID, but we're gonna have a meeting in September. So I'm, I'm just looking for somebody willing to go in case I can't go. Uh, Stephen Look. <laughs> Sure, I'd be, be willing to be the alternate. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, do we need to vote on this? Yeah? Um, in that case, I will entertain a motion to nominate Stephen Look as alternate representative 
to the Centro Vermont Career Center Regional Advisory Board. So moved. This is Lindy. Thank you, Lindy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Chris. Any further discussion? If not, kindly go to your um, participants uh, screen or block or whatever and click yes if you're for, no if you're against. And I'm seeing all yeses. Wonderful. Congratulations, Stephen, and thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. And, and I failed to say that Stephen Dellinger Pate is actually the one that went to all the meetings with me. <laughs> so he, he is, sits on this board too. <laughs> So, so when I think when I say thank you to a Stephen, then um, it, it does double duty. Good. All right. So now we move on to 4.0, the report section. Um, 4.1, superintendent, school opening status update, and board Q's and A's. Um, this is really sort of the center of gravity of the meeting, I figure. Um, what I would propose is that, uh, Brian, if you don't mind leading off, and then what I'd like to do, because this is the kind of thing that could go on at length, um, I'd like to give every board member in turn a chance basically to ask your number one question. And, um, you may hear somebody else ask your number one question during the course of the um, of the going around the table. Um, so feel free to ask another question. What I would like to do, though, is probably um, bring it to a close. It's undoubtedly going to be before everybody has asked everything they want to ask. But my hope is that um, Brian, uh, that sort of the spillover questions can be incorporated onto the website in some way. Um, if there's one that you have not sent, uh, but still want to ask, if you could put that question in email to Brian, um, and that will be sort of the, um, represent the cutting room floor, I guess, uh, the questions that will not that we will not have had a chance to answer. I hope that we will still have be able to um, get a lot of the most important ones out of the way um, this evening. So, uh, Brian, do you wanna take her away? Yes, and then we absolutely. Can... So uh, I just wanna begin by uh, thanking the school board uh, for, uh, for uh, and the steering committee in particular for uh, proposing this uh, Q and I, I, over the last, uh, I would say two weeks, we've been getting lots of questions from the public. We answer questions. Uh, sometimes they lead to more questions. Uh, sometimes they lead to more questions that we need to go back and look up. Uh, I will say that the, uh, one of the big overarching questions was about how decisions are being made. And, uh, you know, and so ultimately I, I'll, I can start off with that. And I, I kind of had that in my, uh, in my, uh, memo in, to uh, the school board, it's in the board packet, talking about the, how decisions are being made, the decision-making process, what we're, where we've been thinking. But the biggest piece is the idea of flexibility. I think our biggest guiding principle is being flexible. And I think it's very important that parents in the audience par uh, and teachers in the audience understand, and, and staff members and board member, everyone understands that uh, we're trying, we're, our school system and the school systems of Vermont and, the, and throughout the country have been asked to do something that we've never done before, uh, which is basically uh, prepare for a reopening of school uh, after we've shut everything down and uh, within this, in this uh, climate of high anxiety, uh, high, high fear, uh, high concerns. And, you know, and, I, and I do understand that. And I, I will say that uh, earlier today, even, uh, I had a news reporter reach out and they're, they're also asking questions about, you know, what are the major factors that you're using in order to uh, plan for reopening of school? And so I could take everyone through the process uh, briefly because I know that was a major question. I'd also 
fielded uh, last week and even today uh, from uh, different members of the community uh, as well as uh, board members. So the, the first thing is, you know, the biggest factor that we have is we've been receiving uh, early in the earlier in the summer, the state of Vermont released a uh, safe and healthy reopening guidelines. Um, they were released in June and the school district had already composed five task forces. Uh, and these, these basically are task forces that are, which were formed with many teachers, uh, teacher leaders, administrators, uh, members uh, uh, in ESP or ESP union, and trying to get everyone together to focus on different areas of the reopening process. So we have task forces in curriculum instruction and assessment, facilities and health, logistics, policy, finance, and communication, and social emotional learning. Uh, so they've been working on trying to uh, determine their, their scope of the work. And the scope of the work has really been based off of the guidelines for reopening, which come from the Agency of Education, the Center for Disease, uh, CDC, Center for Disease Control, uh, and the, the Department of Health. So uh, the biggest question that we had to face uh, with these task forces, as well as our leadership team, uh, which meets twice, which met twice a week during the uh, during the month of July, and uh, it seems like we're meeting all the, every. Feels like we're almost having meetings every day this week, but we're not. <laughs> we're having another big meeting tomorrow. Uh, the we've been really focusing on: can we implement these guidelines? Can we do this? And and if we can't right now, what do we need to do in order to implement the guidelines? And so some of the uh, the guidelines that are in there. Uh, discuss social distancing, making sure folks are wearing masks, uh, temperature checks when students enter the building. Uh, so, and, and how do we do that? And what are the log logistics in doing that? And it may look a little different in each school based on the building. It might, based on the student population. Uh, the, guid the guidance also says that it is preferable to prioritize um, the instruction of the pre-K through eighth graders uh, who are younger, uh, who, according to the science, uh, are not as susceptible uh, to uh, spreading the, and transmitting the disease as uh, older children, older adults, and, and young adults. And so we really, at an early stage, determined that we really want to be able to see if we can prioritize a return to live instruction for our children, especially our young, young children, because uh, we felt that it is the best intervention we can provide for our children if we can do it. So that, that was the big piece, can we do it? Uh, and, and I have to say in Washington Central, our school district, we've been blessed in having really beautiful buildings. Uh, we have uh, smaller student populations and we're able to do social distancing and be able to provide certain, uh, be able to implement the guidance. Now I can't speak for other school districts because that's been a, uh, a topic of conversation, uh, you know, Mr. I have received several conversations, several notes from others saying, "Why are we not? Why are we not following what other districts are doing?" Well, we, we're different than the other districts. Uh, we have uh, more space. We are able to implement the guidance uh, by by. by over the past month, we did ask for a number of purchases. We're able to do a lot of things that other districts may not be able to do. Uh, based on social di social distancing requirement is a big one, I will say. In my conversations with other uh, superintendents, they might not be able to have all their children in the school every day under the social distancing requirement. So they have to look at different models. Uh, in our buildings, if we realize if we can socially distance and, 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 and make sure folks are wearing masks, what else do we need to do to protect our children? Uh, putting isolation rooms in every building. I mean, you've heard about this before. Uh, updating our air ventilation systems uh, to double the standard of what is expected in Vermont. Right now it's 15 cubic feet per minute of fresh air per student in a room. We are trying to get it up to 30 by the end of the summer. Uh, we have mechanical engineers going in, up to, looking at the HVAC. Uh, we have a short-term goal that we want to get done before the end before the end of the summer, so we have more fresh air going into the buildings. Uh, we have Brian, a medium. Brian, yep. so sorry to interrupt. I, yep. I know you're warming to your theme, yep. and um, HVAC in particular is yep. a new area of expertise that you've been cultivating. <laughs> yes. Um, what I, I I wonder I wonder if 
um, if it would be okay, uh, if it would not sort of um, throw you off your groove, okay. if we were maybe to, um, to get into some of the questions sure. and if some of this information that you've got, which is very important, of course, if mm -hmm. it can maybe weave it into your answers into the question. Okay. Um, where, where appropriate. Sure. Um, if, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. So um, what I would propose uh, is essentially to um, Floor, would you mind leading off with, <laughs> I, 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 I hope I didn't I've, I think that I've spoke, I, I've, I have spoken a lot. Uh, I would like to hear, especially uh, Jonas, uh, I, I know that this was something that you asked for, Jonas, so I, I think you should you, you should lead. I, of course, have a question and I'm, I'm happy to go after, but I would like Jonas and some people that haven't spoken today to go first. Excellent. Very, very generous. Um, in that case, Jonas, if you don't mind starting off, then uh, Jonathan on deck and um, Dorothy, what do we used to say in Little League? Dorothy in the, in the hall? Is that how In the hall. In the hall. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Very good. Jonas? It is hard for me to choose my number one question to ask as I have a list of 35 to 40 questions that I provided to Brian uh, earlier this week at his request from the board for their questions. Um, so um, I was hoping that this, uh, this session would be more extensive and free flowing. Um, I will ask the first question on my list. How many options were considered for this plan, um, including hybrid plans for elementary, all at home, high school, you know, full time? How many plans were considered uh, before deciding on in person for K through eight and hybrid for high school? And I and, and and sorry, Brian. You know, we we've we've heard a lot about. Um, you know, I appreciate your your diagram, right? Uh, the the flow diagram of how decisions are being made. Um, what I'm trying to get into is a sense of how these conversations occur, mm -hmm. and you know what was rejected, what was considered. Okay. Great. So, uh, so uh, so in creating the schedules and deciding upon the options. Uh, we looked at the sources of data, uh, including the health and safety guidance from the Agency of Education. Uh, the uh, leadership team had also put out a, a results of a staff caregiver and student remote learning surveys that were administered at the end of uh, the school year uh, back in uh, June. The leadership team came to a consensus quite quickly that uh, we wanted to and needed to prioritize in-person learning for pre-K through eight. Uh, we feel fortunate we can do that because um, pre-K through eight students uh, for, to, to give that option to our students because we have the spacious uh, buildings and grounds. Uh, so that was one of that was uh, you know one of the big things. The other uh, big thing was uh, at the uh, at U32 uh, that we reviewed options for school opening around around the world. They looked at uh, options around the world and also around the country to determine what would best fit our students and our community given our cur the current data uh, that was uh, provided to us. May I ask a follow-up? Sure. Um, it, I mean, it sounds like that decision was self-evident and yet we look around our state um, and our county and we see school districts making very, very different choices. And I'm not saying one choice is right or one choice is wrong, but I think that I, you know, I would like to know, you know how deeply other options were considered. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I, I could say that the, the other options were considered, however, in the guidance that uh, the state put out, uh, they did say that we should be prioritizing if, uh, if we could meet the requirements that they put out to uh, have a full return to school, especially for our younger children. If I may, Brian. Um, so Jonas, I think speak, to speak specifically to how did we come up with the week on, week off kind of hybrid, which is not something that you're seeing in the rest of the state. Um, you know, we really looked at a lot of those, what are the models? Like what, does, what are they doing? And a lot of the splits that we saw that were having to be done by other schools uh, was because of household needs. 
Um, so when they had elementary school out on a hybrid system as well, they had to create schedules in which families were um, both in and out, um, you know, as, as whole families. So that, that created a different uh, problem. I would say that we've looked at the, the model that Chittenden County is doing, and it doesn't really suit our needs right now um, of having kids in the building as much as possible. But we also used uh, some of the information that was coming out of, um, you know, really towards the beginning of summer is looking at a model where you try to reduce transmission based upon the incubation period of the virus itself. And so having a week on week off means that we have nine days of remote learning, uh, you know, five of them remote and then two, the weekends themselves, um, where if someone were exposed, they're most likely to show symptoms during that time and they would not be in the school building. And so we tried to bring a lot of that into account too. And quite honestly, being able to prioritize having the elementary kids in school helped us create a model that was different than most of the schools that are in the state. Um, thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, and Brian and Jonas, um, it, we'll move on and, and we'll, we'll get back to um, other opportunities. Jonathan, um, Dorothy on deck and Jill in the hall. Yeah, Brian, first of all, thanks, thanks for everything you're doing um, in considering all of these huge, huge challenges before you and before the entire district, really. Um, so I guess my question is, Given all the sifting of all the data and the guidance and the science and all the things that you've looked at, what what have you identified uh, in your professional judgment as as really being the highest priority uh, for our district right now as we head into school reopening? Our uh, thank you. That's a great question, uh, Jonathan, and uh, thank you for asking it. The uh, highest priority, uh, in, in my opinion, is in my professional judgment, is uh, our ability to be flexible and pivot if we need to. Uh, so uh, right now uh, we have, uh, I think the biggest uh, concern right now is any plan we put out there, whatever it could be, a hybrid plan, remote learning plan, um, full instruction, depends on whether or not we have the staff. Uh, and so I think the uh, last two weeks, the board has really I feel empowered uh, the uh, district and myself and uh, my team to be prepared for uh, making sure we have the staff to implement whatever plan that we have to implement. Uh, so we, you know, right now, we're, if we can prioritize and meet the guidelines and do it with fidelity, and the question comes down to is, there are some staff that are scared out there and, and there are some staff who have some medical concerns, legitimate concerns, and we have until uh, we put a, a deadline of August 12th to try to find out who is going to take us up on our leave requests, who's going to be taking us up on um, asking for uh, having their children attend schools uh, or supervision. So, and I, so I think that's the biggest priority right now in my mind is, I mean, a few weeks ago, if you asked me that question, I, my, the highest priority would have been, are we going to be able to get the contractors in here to build these isolation rooms? And are we going to be, have the time to uh, build, finish some of these uh, requests? Are we going to get the supplies that come in, uh, like the plexiglass and, and making sure we can get that set up in the schools? Though, the, uh, but I've been told that two or three weeks from now, all those things will be coming in. So I think the biggest priority is, as of right now, is do we have the staff to implement the plans that we're trying to implement? Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. So, um, Dorothy, Jill, then Chris. Um, I'd like to know, know more about um, the elementary school setups. Uh, I'm probably very likely the only one here who went to school in the 40s and 50s when our desks and chairs were bolted to the, to the floor in line facing straight ahead and you sat in your chair and behaved yourself. Um, and uh, kids were able to get up and pass papers or pick up papers and things like that, but I don't see that happening. Um, I, one memory I have is in first grade when it was time to have a little project where we might be 
gluing Halloween, Halloween masks or something, the teacher would come around with a piece of, a piece of uh, paper towel and give you a dollop of paste. And then hopefully you wouldn't have eaten the paste by the rest of the stuff has brought to you. I, I just see knowing children having to change from the wonderful best practices ways of teaching that we have been doing to sit in rows and be able to contain themselves i and they will try their hardest because they want to be in school with their friends i understand that but i just i just don't see it as best practices and i'm wondering if if the risk is worth that. I, I just have a lot of those questions, but I, I really, I, I understood the remote uh, plans that you sent. They were fairly clear, although I felt a little rigid, um, <clears throat> but I, I really don't understand what's actually gonna be happening in the classrooms other than they'll be sitting in rows and they'll stay within their group although they may have different teachers from time to time or move as a group to another room for another teacher. But I just wonder how they're going to kind of soften the edges. So, uh, so I mean, I think you've said a lot there, Dorothy. Uh, so to uh, try to answer your, answer your question, what I hear is uh, how are we going to work with children who are going to be possibly sitting in rows facing one direction right where as back, maybe back in the 40s and 50s that's how classes were uh, but we know that's not the best practice for um, our children currently and uh, right so is that it's how are we going to try to resolve that is that the question uh, well that but I forgot to also add when I went to school uh, the education was still focused on education. The schools had not then been required to take care of the social, emotional, and physical life of, of the children and be the caretakers as well. So when I went to school, it was education was the business, um, yep. but it was still could have been better, I'm sure, but I did okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so uh, so I, I think the uh, you know it's a challenge, right? It's a, definitely a challenge. It's not a you know, and 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 I would and maybe people don't want to hear that, but it's true. I mean, I, I agree with you. It's definitely a, a major challenge uh, for reopening schools. So I think uh, you know, we heard Kat talk about how we're going to try to provide some professional development uh, for our teachers and to get come into buildings and how to work with our children and how to try to re-engage. I think it's also gonna be very important to get the teachers back and into these classrooms uh, for, for you know at least 10 days before uh, the, the children get there so we can start coming up with plans. And you know, someone told me a while, the devil is in the details. You can have the plans, but as you get closer and closer to unpeeling the onion, you get closer and closer to the details. And the, I know that the um, principals have, have been working uh, and we're, we're talking more about what, how we're gonna be supporting our teachers when they do come back to get ready for having children sit in rows. It's not ideal, uh, but and I do think that you know, there may be some opportunities to take children out, uh, have them go outside, you know, try to mix up the day a little bit, but I do know those first 30 days are gonna be really crucial for really just trying to reconnect kids to school because uh, I think it's gonna be a very challenging time when uh, everyone comes back and we're, trying to get folks used to coming back to school when they haven't done it for five months. I don't know if any of the elementary principals wanted to add anything in, in addition to anything that, you know, you think you might be preparing for uh, your opening days with your faculty and your schools uh, regarding uh, Dorothy's inquiry about you know, children sitting in, in, a, in a rows. But I, and I, there is one thing I could say is, you know, the other option is having children sit at, sit at home and we do know that there are some children that are really suffering by being at home, not being around their friends. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, there's a lot of concerns about the wellness of children sitting at home. And it, even if they can just come to school and be in rows around other children, it, it will it could help them. Uh, so I don't know if any principals want to. I, I see Aaron's hand up. Yeah. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> 
I think one thing that Dorothy said that resonates with me is that, you know, we are responsible not just for the the three R's anymore. It's the whole child. Um, I think one thing we learned when we dismissed in the spring is that it was very difficult to fully meet the needs of kids because they they literally have to be in school um, for us to carry out what we're responsible for this day and age as as schools. Um, so I remember reflecting with with my teachers that we're doing the best we can remotely, but we knew and we know that so many kids need to be in the building to maximize their whole self, not just academically, but like you said, social, emotional, um, physical. <laughs> um, so, and I, and, and I think maybe even to connect to Jonas's question as well, I think when we knew at the beginning of the summer that we were all uh, able to physically safely have students come back to the building, it was the first step to, yes, this is this is awesome. Like we can have kids back and we want them back five days a week, full days. I know I'm talking about, you know, for elementary. Um, so, you know, it. you're right. It's not ideal to be sitting in rows and facing forward and, you know, the kind of the old fashioned way, <laughs> but um, it is going to be way better in my opinion than what we experienced in the, in the spring for a lot of kids. Thanks, Aaron. Um, good. In that case, we have Jill, Chris, and then Stephen Luck. Thanks. Um, so, Brian, I've been reading everything you've been sending around with with interest. So, thank you for for all that work to to you and your and the team. Um, my, I was just trying to understand, and maybe this is in the materials, but for the K through eight, are the options uh, binary? So it's either full time in person or full time remote, but not not hybrid in the sense that some kids could do part of the day home, part of the day remote. Just trying to understand the thinking around that, and it, and if it is indeed binary. Uh, yes, uh, currently, currently it is a binary. Those are the two major options currently. Uh, again, though, you know, we're we're trying to figure out, you know, will this work? Will you know, and we may have to look at other yeah. options. Yeah. That's good, Joe. You got your answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, then Chris, Stephen, and Towns. Okay, Scott. Um, hi, Brian. How are you? Hey, good. How are we doing? <laughs> good. Oh, yeah. I have um, a combined question, but that is uh, around the same topic. Um, and it is um, if a student or a staff member tests positive in a school, uh, what happens in terms of um, quarantining for the rest of the school population in that school? Um, and the next is, what is the threshold level at which a decision to go completely remote would be made? Is there a numerical level that we're looking at? Um, has that been discussed in any way? Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for asking that question, question Chris. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the threshold level and so and if a staff member tests positive so what I what I've received currently uh, from the uh, secretary of education I, I do meet with him regularly he, he does do an hour Q and A with the superintendents around the state of Vermont uh, and some of these questions were asked and currently what the guidance that we received is if a staff member tests positive uh, or or a student tests positive. Uh, there's going to have to be a decision made by the superintendent in conjunction with the Department of Health uh, to uh, determine whether or not to close a school or close a district, uh, depending on what the uh, data, what the what the actual uh, situation says. Uh, I don't know if uh, our COVID-19 coordinator, Elizabeth Worth, has anything else to add on that one. I saw her. I saw so her. let me just... I'm just looking for my. Let me ask a quick follow. Oh, 
Go ahead. What 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 criteria are you looking at to make that determination? If it, if you're doing it in conjunction with the Department of Health, what criteria are you relying upon to make that determination? So so basically, the, the, and I think that goes to your second question, right? So I was going to answer that one. The well, threshold. It actually, goes, it actually goes to both because of the individual um, um, positive result. What was the implication to the entire school? And it mm -hmm. sounded like there would be criteria to, to consider on whether the school would be closed or whatnot. Yep. So Thank Elizabeth, you, you wanna uh, answer that last part and then I can jump in about the threshold? Sure. You know, I think I think what I, what I understand is that we really will rely on the Department of Health and their, and their COVID tracing. If, if, if a student goes home, um, Nothing really happens in the in the classroom. You know, kids are going to be going home for a lot of things, not just you know extreme sickness. Anything we don't want sick kids in school, um, just for safety's sake. So, it, but if if a child does test positive for COVID, then the Department of Health will be notified. They will notify us, and then they will do the in, the interview was really important. How many? they will look at where this comes from, how much community-based it is, and then they will make a decision about whether they even need to um, uh, contact trace the kids in the classroom. They may and they may not. Um, and, and so there's not, there's not a absolute um, guideline about, you know, one child means the class goes home, none of that. It, it really doesn't mean that. So, but it doesn't mean they're not safe. It means that you know we we will really rely upon the Department of Health to figure that out. And um, and as for the threshold level, uh, so during my weekly meetings, the secretary goes over some metrics about the state of Vermont. Uh, he looks at uh, you know, our ability to do contract tracing, our effect, a number of affected uh, people, transmission rates, uh, and uh, the uh, currently all those pieces according and I just received doc uh, uh, some additional updates uh, yesterday uh, from the the agency of education that they believe that the current low and the, the current positive numbers do point to a reopening of school now people had asked what which that what what would the numbers need to look like in those areas in order to close school or go to full remote learning? And the answer is uh, the state has not provided that uh, information. Good, thank you for the directness. Yep. Okay, thanks, Chris. So uh, Stephen Look, and since Towns has evidently moved on to better things, Diane, then Lindy. Uh, I'll give my question to Jonas. Very nice, Stephen. Jonas. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate that. Um, my question is about testing. Uh, will any testing be done before school opens? Will there be surveillance testing available during the year? Who pays for testing? Um, uh, and um, you know, if there is, you know, if there is a positive test in our one of our school communities, you know, who will be able to get tested? I mean, I think I heard Elizabeth say, you know, there is no protocol for that. Um, do we know that, you know, at what point would our community, right, because we're talking about a community of five towns here, that everyone's public health, right, will be, um, you know, in one big web, you know, with all the children in school together, you know, if there is a case, will we have access to the pop-up testing facility that was used to such great effect in places like Manchester recently? Okay, so I, uh, Jonas, uh, I did ask that question recently, uh, and uh, the answer I got was testing will not be available uh, due to the contagious nature of the disease. Uh, so uh, the idea is uh, it, it, if you do testing one day, uh, if, so, if someone is infected the next day, you would miss them. So that they're not going to, uh, the state has said there would not be any uh, testing available uh, before the school year. What about during the school year? Will we have the ability to conduct any surveillance testing? Is there a plan at the state level, at the regional level? 
Uh, no, I, I again, I, I, and as of right now, the, the the only answer is that they were not going to be doing testing uh, at this time. That's I mean, I don't know, Elizabeth. Have you heard anything else? No, I think that's true, and I think part of the reason is because it won't give us any information with the level of disease in Vermont. Um, it's really not necessary, and it, it, it and again, it's a it's a one day thing. If you test positive. Negative today doesn't mean tomorrow you won't be positive. And we have so few cases that it's not expedient. And it also, what they what somebody mentioned to me is that, you know, when somebody gets a um, negative test, they tend to think, oh, well, you know, I don't have to wear my mask today. You know, they, it gives them a sense of like freedom to not follow some of the um, mitigating things that we're doing. So um, they're not interested in doing, I think that if there was a, a, a large number of cases, if that happened, I'm sure that that would open up the possibility of doing testing. And we certainly, if we send a kid home and they have certain symptoms, they will check with their provider and the provider will decide whether they think that that child or the adult needs to be tested. And then it's available. And as far as cost goes, that's, a, that's an up in the air thing. You know, some insurances pay for it. Sometimes it could be free. We can figure that out for kids though, if they need a test we can figure out how they're gonna get it and, and not have to pay for it. Does that answer your question? Jonas, does that um, Yes, I will follow up if, if the opportunity presents itself. Great, thanks. Um, and thanks again, Stephen. So uh, Diane, Lindy and Fleur. My question has to do with, um, are there going to be like scheduled mask breaks for kids? Is there a plan around some outdoor time that will provide outdoor education or mask breaks as well for um, both staff and kids? Uh, so, I know we were, uh, uh, the, our, our leadership team has been discussing that. I've also received quite uh, that, that inquiry from a, a member of the public who uh, was concerned about, uh, do we have to change our masks? So I know, uh, I know we've gotten a lot of questions about the masks. Uh, one of the things is how do we build endurance for wearing masks during the school day? Uh, and and uh, I know we were talking about, is there a way to, you know, you start off with wearing masks you know, at home and asking parents to wear their mask at home for three hours and work, work, your, way, work your way up. Um, we were, we had been discussing that. Uh, as of outdoor time, as of outdoor time, I know that we've been feeling some questions about outside instruction and, you know, we're definitely exploring outside possibilities. But uh, the grounds are different at each school. So uh, some schools have natural shade. Uh, I do know that uh, some schools have reached out to look at the use of tents to bring kids outside. Uh, I know one school look has uh, asked parents to donate tents. Another school has asked the National Guard to donate tents. Uh, unfortunately, the rental the rentals for some of these tents are like two or three hundred dollars a day. And so, does it is it physically uh, is that the best way we could put where we could put our money, or should we be putting more money into making sure we improve the indoor air quality of our schools and try to so that that's one of the things trying to uh, figure out. I don't know if uh, you have any, uh, Elizabeth, if you wanna talk more about the masks and schedule mask breaks, because I know uh, we did discuss this. Oh, I, I absolutely think that kids are gonna need to take their masks off from time to time. There's no doubt about that. And, and we will provide that opportunity. I think the most important time, like in the hallways, in lines, places where they cannot keep six foot distance is more important, but they need to be able to have a break and, um, and we, have, we haven't got the total procedure down as far as like how many masks and what they do with them, but they'll, they'll be able to put them in a bag, put them in their backpack and have an, have an additional one. We'll have plenty of extras for kids who need them. And, um, and I think there will be outdoor time. I mean, it might not be, but and when they're outdoors, as long as they're keeping six feet apart, they'll be able to um, have a break. And we're, we've also talked about some of the younger kids, you know, developmentally preschoolers, it's, you know, they don't get that, and and but they need constant reminders, and they need modeling and reminders, and the, I know that the summer program has had no problems with it, really. These young kids, they've, they've, 
they've accepted it and they're wearing their masks, you know, and they need to be reminded on and off and they may need to change a mask, that's true. But, um, but I think absolutely that's important and people are, are aware of that, you know, and teachers are aware of that, so. And I also want to see if I know Gillian is here. Uh, Gillian here. She's on. She's uh, one of our members of the uh, facilities task force. And I know uh, they've been looking and talking about uh, tents and if it's possible to have tents or outdoor. What kind of outdoor things we can do, uh, Gillian? Right. So in terms of some of the stuff for facilities, um, I kind of joke that that it's the shopping task force. Um, but really, because you know of the, the PPE and the cleaning supplies and all that stuff, but um, really looking at in terms of a lot of the things that we're ordering is, is what can we do that we can also have future use for. And tents, the rental of them is pretty prohibitive. Uh, and then the concern is about the big event tents, if we were to purchase some of them, the concerns about setting them up properly and the risk. Now, in terms of getting kids outside, without masks and I think this kind of also speaks to what Dorothy was talking about is is yes I mean kids are going to be sitting in rows but if within each of our buildings and sort of our settings what do we have that we can use as extensions of our classroom so while it's not formalized outdoor education which is a really sort of specific curriculum um, it's really about encouraging teachers to take kids outside, maybe they have their mini lesson on reading and then they take their books outside and they read. Or maybe they practice being scientists by walking around uh, and taking notes about what they see. But really, how can we, how can we physically in the buildings have kids in what we know is not the best practice set up? And then how can we be creative with what we're doing with them sort of beyond that. Um, I know at Doty, we're looking at, um, instead of having like one recess, how do you have several short recesses throughout the day? And I know that people are looking really creatively at the schedule because I know, I mean, even for adults, masks are hard to wear for a long time. Thank Thanks. you, Gillian. Thanks everyone. You're good, Diane? Great, thanks. Uh, Lindy, then Flora, and then me. I keep turning off my camera because once again, internet is unstable. But um, my question is about the staff and, and I don't think you can control families, but staff you have some control over, their activities prior to when school starts. I am very pleased with how Vermont is handling itself. Our numbers are down. I'm not nearly as concerned as I would be if I was living somewhere else, but it hasn't made me less cautious. But I'm, a, I'm wondering about people who have gone to family gatherings in other states or done things outside of our state coming back, if there's anything that um, checklist or things that staff are going to have to be signing off on so uh so i i would think that uh one of the things is uh we do have uh, and maybe i can even have somebody from u32 talk about their procedure uh and i will say that we uh copy we copied their procedure for our central office and uh how when people come into our building now uh so i don't know if anyone i don't know if steven or or somebody else from u32 wants to talk about their procedure when they when folks do come into their building because I think that's kind of like what we've been doing. And I also think we are also looking at uh, uh, some other technology pieces about uh, using Basecamp to talk about their uh, their um, temperatures and things like that. But I think what you're saying, Lindy, is if they went out of state, is anyone asking them, hey, did you go out of state? Did you go anywhere? All right, that's, what you're, that, that's, your, that's your question, correct? Yes, mine is more not about walking in the building, signing in, taking your temperature. Yeah, Mine is about kind of your contacts prior to coming into the building to teach the children. Um, yeah. And you got together with all your aunts and uncles and grandparents in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, hey, uh, so I, I have parents in New Jersey. What are you trying to say? No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just playing. It's just kidding, Lindy. <laughs> I'm not going to New Jersey. Together in Alabama, I did not go. <laughs> 
I'm not going to New Jersey anytime soon. So, uh, but I will say that uh, one of the things is, uh, one of the questions is, have you been around anyone uh, with uh, you know, contact? We do have those types of questionnaires when you walk into the building. I know U32 does have uh, that. We ha we've implemented it at our, at our in central office. Uh, I have been putting, a, I did put a communication out recently uh, to uh, teachers and staff you know, saying that you know if you have to you have to quarantine. You're you're, advised, you're not allowed. You're really not permitted to go visit right before the uh, right before we start the school year. You can't put yourself into a situation where you have to quarantine for 14 days because you took a, a vacation to in New Jersey on August 20th. You know, uh, if we're having teachers come back on the 24th. So we did put those things out there, um, and uh, that that is the expectation. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Lindy. Um, thank you, Brian. Floor? So I, I have a, I don't know if I call this a question, but it, how can I make sure that I'm supporting you in removing barriers so you can be there for all the children? And what I'm referring to is, to give you an example, you know, like the ADM, if people decide to, to homeschool, for example, if some of our community members, because no choice is a bad choice, uh, how do we how do you reach out to us to make sure that we're you know either reaching out to our legislature to ask them to hold us hammerless for the ADM and another uh, another one uh, that it just came to my attention today is that the special ed especially has moved into um, compensatory model so how you know so how can we make sure uh, do you feel that you have enough communicate, I think you do, but how do we make sure that we're supporting you so that you can take care of the kids just like we're doing in the, uh, in all the PPE and stuff like that? Is there any other stressor that we can make sure that we're removing? So especially for special ed kids, you know, to support that IEP processes. Yeah, so I, I can answer some of those questions, uh, Floor. Uh, two of the, I mean, I, I, I know we did receive questions about, uh, you know, some of the, about homeschooling and, you know, if parents go on homeschooling, are they going, is that going to take away our um, uh, revenue stream for some, from, from, from some of our families? Uh, so I, I would you know, let, I know you, I know some of the board members do talk to legislators. I do think it's important uh, that when the legislator does meet in August, that they do hear from us, uh, from our, from our, uh, from our board that we really hope that they will not, uh, penalize or to do a moratorium on homeschooling uh, uh, because, and I think that there are a lot of superintendents and board of educations out there in, around Vermont that are um, you know, asking their legislative, their de legislative delegations to consider this. Uh, I think it's gonna be something that, you know, if 45 out of 55 school districts ask their legislators, that might be something that they, they're only gonna be meeting for, from what I understand, three to five weeks or four weeks when they do come back. And so they're going to have a lot of work on their plate. So if more and more uh, boards and uh, came and came with one united thing around that piece, that may be something that could help help our schools. Um, the other piece is in along the same lines, and it may be a little more complicated, is asking our uh, again do it through a similar process, but asking that uh, if we're taking in, I don't know how many students we're going to be taking in to enroll into our schools, but. Uh, Hopefully, you know the money does follow the student in some ways. Uh, we are trying to implement a uh, implement the guidance that was provided by the state with fidelity, and I believe we're doing a very good job of it. Uh, so hopefully, we're not penalized for doing the right thing. Um, so th that I think that would be very helpful, you know, from a, a political you know standpoint, and asking our legislators for that support. Um, as for special ed, can you uh, repeat the special ed question? I just want to make sure. And, and we don't need to get into details. My, the basis of the question is like, you know, I, I, I hope that this communication is back and forth and that you guys, if there's any way that as my, I, I think by reading all the plan, I feel, if, you know, there's too many, you know, there's, it's not going to be perfect for for everybody, but at the same time, as board me as a board member, we are responsible for a whole community, not just as individuals. So, how can I make sure that we are being, uh, you know, supportive of you guys so you can make the best decisions? Is there anything that we're missing? That 
Uh, I, I would think think that the school board's been extremely supportive. I mean, we're having weekly meetings. Are you, I mean, I, you probably have been putting in, I know you put up the hours, you almost put a 40 hour work week into the summer already just on board meetings. So, uh, and so I, I, I think, I think you, uh, you're, you're doing it. And uh, again, just talk, those two pieces I think are gonna be huge moving forward. Thank you. Thanks. Is that good? Um, so in my case, I think I can do no better than follow the example of Stephen Locke and yield to you, Jonas. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I will take that opportunity. Um, um, so let me ask, see my, my menu options here. Um, so it's become clear that, uh, that, that you know, the, the binary option between um, you know, five days in school for elementary kids and fully remote uh, means just that. Um, I've seen guidance in a couple of communications from principals that students who choose, that families who choose the remote option, uh, those children will not be allowed to participate in any in-school activities, including recess, um, or you know outdoor walks or things like that and I just wonder what the logic is there right that we are you know that we're you know it sounds like the district is um, confident that the PPE and you know uh, safety measures and protocols in place in the buildings are enough to prevent a you know you know transmission or an outbreak or at least mitigate that uh, the best we can um, but I wonder what the logic is for you um, for preventing kids from participating in probably the most safe activity possible, which is recess outside. Um, we're, you know, I'll, you know, my family is really concerned about this. Um, you know, the the so, you know, we hear a lot about the social aspect of schools, um, you know, and the, the kids' social lives. Um, we've heard, you know, feedback from a number of parents uh, and you know community members who think that the remote learning option is too rigid. You know that you know I will see what happens with that. But the opportunity for kids to interact socially with the members of their cohort, right, who they are going to be um, isolated from during the year if they choose the remote option and will be in a, a, a you know a, a, a remote only cohort. Um, so I would ask what the logic is, and um, you know urge you to reconsider that. Um. So uh, I mean, we we uh, so I think uh, what you're asking is uh, if a family chooses the remote learning option, will students be allowed to come to school for recess, recess or other out of school uh, building activities, right? So uh, the the short answer is uh, no, and let me explain why. Uh, so they're not going to be allowed to come because uh, we're trying to make sure that we have the uh, protocols and procedures in uh, in place to adhere to the guidelines that uh, that have been put out. For creating pods of students, uh, the, so the guides, the guidance is really trying to make sure the kids that are in the building are working in pods, uh, and we're minimizing uh, student and adult interactions between the pods. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I guess I can have Jen. If Jen is there, she can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, you know, about the pods, um, you know, Jen, are you there? I am here. Sorry, I was having Sorry. trouble unmuting. Um, yeah, so we've been talking in addition to um, all the teaching and learning information about the health and safety guidance, uh, which in encourages us to minimize the, um, the interacting between groups of students and adults as well. So I know that principals are working hard to set up schedules and places to go in the school, in, in certain classrooms and outside that minimize the mixing of those groups so that we can protect the well-being of our students. And so our need to do that means that um, we're not able to sort of risk other exposure to folks who aren't within that pod. That's the primary uh, reason that we're thinking that right now. Is that good, Jonas? Um, it's certainly an answer. Okay, thank you very much. And and I, I noticed that um, Jael has joined us very discreetly in the meantime. And Jael, um, do you have a question that you would like to, to put to the administration? Welcome, by the way. Uh, I've been off and on. Um, I was on my phone for a while um, and lost connection. 
Um, so I'm just getting back on. I don't even know where we're really at in the conversation. Um, I guess my question, can you hear me? We can indeed. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I feel a lot better at, um, after hearing from Kat. Um, you know, I feel like everyone is really thinking about the mental health of students and, and kind of the stress that this will cause, as well as the stress that this will cause to teachers. Um, I've heard that some schools, not in Vermont, but in other states are looking at going to half day to alleviate the, the kind of the stress to masks, wearing masks for such a long time. And I'm very concerned about that. Um, and I did hear Gillian say that she, um, there would be more recess time. Um, I'd like a little more detail on that. Um, but one concern, I guess, for me personally is um, if a student is placed in a pod with students that she or he is having a hard time with, if they're able to move to a different pod or if they're stuck with those same students for the whole entire year. Um, like if there's any issues around bullying or um, just things like that, if there's any wiggle room for students to change their classroom or their pod. I have a lot more questions and just for brevity's sake, I will ask that one. Thanks. Uh, Brian, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you allocate the um, speakers. I think we have to be open to that. Uh, I, I think uh, developmentally, we want the child to you know, be in school, right? We want children to be in school. And even if we're, there was no pandemic, uh, the bullying, uh, if the kid, if the child is getting uh, mean-spirited activities against him or her, uh, we, we would need to uh, try to get to the bottom of that and find a resolution and give the child some uh, counseling and coping and try to find ways to stop that from happening. Um, so I, I do think that it, it, we have to be open to that possibility, but we have to also make sure we do this. If, if something like that does happen, we would have to do that in a medically uh, sound uh, manner. Um, I see Stephen is. Um, yeah, I, I would offer. Um, so the idea of a pod at the middle and high school level is there's actually two levels to it. There is both a classroom level where we're putting about 15 students in a class um, that we're going to keep together as much as possible, just that 15. But we're also going to have a larger group that's the team that's going to be about 60 students and six to seven teachers. And so if there was a need to move a student um, during, you know, any time, and in fact, we've already talked about at some point in time, we do want to mix them up, you know, so when it's appropriate, we can then take the groups of 15 and remix them some uh, within the group of 60. Um, and so uh, we're, we, we just want to make sure that we don't start in a situation where kids are moving around too much as we get used to everything. And so, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to think of ways that, you uh, we don't want kids to have to sit with the same 14 other kids for every day for the entire year. Uh, I don't think any of us would want that. Um, and so we are going to look at ways that we can certainly mix them throughout the year when it's appropriate and when it's medically, you know, it, it, when it when it looks like the virus it is, is at a spot where it allows for us to do that. Um, so we, we certainly are taking that into account. Thank you very much. Um, I, I believe, uh, and if I have missed anybody, I apologize, but um, have I, has every board member had a chance to ask at least one question? Um, if I missed you, please shout out. Uh, otherwise, um, what I'd like to do, everyone has been so patient um, and so focused. Uh, how about if we take a five minute break and then come back and um, pick up and, and we'll take it from there. Um, any objection? Five minutes. Return, let's say 829. 829, see you back here. Thanks. I'm back. Refreshed, I hope. So um, we're at, at this point, we're at a bit of a fork in the road. 
Um, if there's if there's an appetite among board members for continuing, um, we can. Uh, if you prefer to that we move on, um, we can do that as well. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Jonas. If you, um, I know you were uh, hoping for something that could perhaps be more free flowing. And I sense that this format tends to be a bit more lumbering. Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly how we might improve on it. Um, well, Scott, now Chris, that everyone's had the everyone that has wanted to ask the question has, we could open it up to folks who have more questions without going uh, necessarily in order. I mean, you, you did a very good Supreme Court job so far uh, um, of taking question after question. But if uh, it, I think opening it up a little bit uh, would be helpful. OK. Um, any objections to then to continuing, say, for another 15 minutes and just uh, freewheeling it? Scott, this is Steve. Look. Thank you, Stephen. I don't object to some time for for additional conversation, um, but um, could we move that later in the agenda and get through the action items that we have and then go back to the discussion? Uh, I'm, I'm absolutely open to that. And um, I see the wisdom in it. I, I, if nobody objects and nobody thinks it will sort of interrupt the, uh, the flow, which we've already interrupted by taking a break anyway. Um, let's, then, um, let's then do that. And if, um, again, if there's no objection, we will have the continuation of 4.1.2 board Q&A after 6.2. Um, we agree by consensus. Yes, uh, Jonas, go ahead. Um, I suspect I'm in the minor minority here, but I, I, would, I would object to that. Um, the consent agenda and the personnel actions should not take more than a handful of minutes. And I would prefer uh, to get more questions on the table um, and more information uh, in front of this meeting um, before we do that. So um, Stephen, I, I think I, I would join Jonas in that so that we don't lose uh, members of the public. Um, who might be very interested in this topic as well. Okay, so um, in that case, what if we then just uh, continue 4.1.2 after 4.2.1? Um, will that will that work? Will that not not work? Maybe I should say. Okay. Um, Good. Then let's let's go to the uh, central office renovations, and then we will return to board Q and A's directly thereafter. So, um, Brian. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, this is uh, for we recently are uh, completing phase one, uh, which was the front part of the renovations. Uh, this uh, second part, phase two. Uh, was is the building the uh, offices in the, in the uh, back part of the building that is already there. We're not adding to the building. We're just adding in what areas that is open to, like open space area into uh, offices. So our staff that work in that area have some protection. Uh, so the we are already uh, on July fifteenth. The board had authorized twenty six thousand dollars for this construction project, and the two bids came in. Uh, that was uh, a total of 36,000. So the bids are over, it's, it's about $14,300 over budget. And uh, in order to complete uh, the phase two, which would help us reopen our central office building. Uh, the reason why it came in over budget was uh, there's a shortage of materials and uh, there's, there's an increase in the cost of materials. Uh, also, the rough drawings uh, that were submitted earlier were, did not include the estimates from vendors. So ultimately, uh, we're, uh, we did review this with the finance committee uh, last week, 
and it was uh, before re proceeding with phase two, uh, it was recommended from the finance committee to request the additional funds at uh, tonight's board meeting. Uh, time is of the essence. We are trying to get these, uh, uh, p this uh, project finished once and for all. We uh, really do need it in order to reopen our uh, central office and we're asking uh, parents to come to school, uh, bring their children to, uh, to have their children come to our school. Uh, without having this project done, it's gonna be difficult to have central office. Uh, we'll have to go back to our rotation of letting people coming into the building and, uh, and uh, leaving the building. And it'll be very difficult uh, in order to do that. Thank you, Brian. So at this point, I would entertain a motion to authorize the superintendent to spend a total of $43,300 for the central office renovations. So moved. Floor moves. Is there a second? Second. Jonas seconds. Thank you very much. Board discussion. So I have, I have a couple questions. Um, um, one is Diana. that... Um, um, I, I, I seem to recall that we were talking about temporary walls, not permanent walls. And I read here in this memo that these are now permanent walls. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how that changed from what um, the initial impression was. Um, second, um, it seems to me very high uh, to have $3,000 worth of locks for 10 doors. Um, and I'd like to have that explained because that's an expenditure we haven't seen before. Uh, and then third is, um, are you saying that if we didn't do this, central office would not be open? Okay, so I, I just want to make sure, Chris, I got, uh, you, want, you want me to discuss uh, locks for the 10 doors, the set, whether or not central office would not reopen, and what was the first part of your question? First part is when this project, we talked about this project, um, oh. I think we had to discuss about these only being temporary walls as opposed to permanent walls. And I see here that these are talking about a permanent change. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, so the it was either, I recall that, partitions versus permanent walls, right? So uh, one of the pieces was, uh, if you put the partition, there was two pieces, uh, either partitions versus permanent walls. Uh, if we have partitions, it is my understanding that may not be reimbursable under the CARES Act. We're trying to get money back for, to help pay for, uh, pay for this. So I believe that is one of the biggest reasons why by having the permanent walls. The second piece was, uh, and that leads into the part about the locks or the doors, is uh, in the age of school shootings and uh, uh, people, you know, hopefully this never ever happens, uh, here in our district, but uh, partitions are not necessarily as safe as having a wall to protect staff in, a, in an office area. Uh, the other piece is the partitions uh, would also, uh, uh, typically when you put up partitions or in an office area, they're typically up there for, uh, they become like walls. So those are, so the idea was to basically build the permanent walls for that reason, for the safety reason, and also for uh, the, CARES Act, uh, it's my understanding that we would get money back to pay for it. No guarantee, but I understand it does qualify for reimbursement. Uh, Lori, do you want to comment on that piece? Um, I also wanted to say there's a delay in a backlog in getting partitions. Um, the architect let us know that it is unknown if we could even get these in the next couple months. So that was one of the reasons why the architect had recommended um, permanent walls. Um, as far as the CARES Act, we are on the list. We've submitted our request. Um, we have submitted it with the permanency of the walls, but if we had to uh, revisit that, we could. It just is unclear how many months we'd have to wait to get those partitions. Um, one of the things the architect said was most schools that put in partitions, they're there forever anyway. They never take them down. So they're not as structurally sound um, for safety reasons. Um, What's the other question? Um, oh, on the locks. Um, yes, it costs around $200 a door for the equipment for the, the locks. Um, and it's about $100 to have them keyed and installed per door. So the proposal that we had had four doors and there's actually 10 additional doors. So I hear you, Chris, this is the first time you've heard of this, but um, 
um, in talking to Brian, we felt like this was the time when we're going to be putting in four doors anyway to do the other 10. Yes. Did we answer uh, all the questions so far? Uh, and, well, and I think you also wanted to know about central office not reopening. But, uh, uh, you know, so I do know that uh, it, it's going to be, I mean, central office could reopen. Uh, it'll just be very difficult because we'll have to have a rotation of some people coming in and out and uh, because they won't be, won't be able to have everyone in that area. Uh, it, it's, it's, so I think, you know, could central office reopen? I think it'd be very, very difficult. Uh, and I, I don't know if it would be a great look uh, for the um, district if we're asking folks to bring their children to school and yet we're not having our central office fully, uh, fully uh, operational. As for the locks, uh, for the 10 doors, those are something that a $3,000 expense could just fall within my um, purview as superintendent to just request and get it done. Um, the, currently, none of the doors in central office have a lock. Uh, so I thought that was a, a pretty a serious uh, safety concern. Uh, in, in, again, in the age of, you know, people don't want to think about it, but in the age of school shootings and, uh, you know, God forbid, we definitely want to make sure that our central office staff is uh, safe uh, and, and has, has, has that. So, uh, we put it in there really, Chris, because uh, if we're if we were going to ask to uh, have someone come and do this work, it would just be great for them to also do this separate do this job as well. That was really the reason. Thanks, uh, thank you, Diane. So I, I guess I'm a little confused as to how we're here again, um, and I'm a little worried that we'll be here again next time. Um, in terms of a request that. Um, and I, and I think it comes, it comes back to maybe we should have asked better questions in terms of what an estimate was in terms of a commitment or an RFP. Um, but I guess that's my biggest concern. We increased it last time. Now we're going to increase it again. And what happens if we come back next month or next week, whenever it is we're meeting again, and it's another 10 to 20. So that, that concerns me. Lindy. I share your concern, Diane, and I questioned an expenditure on the warrant this time because I don't think I understood that we were spending $15,000 on a software program for healthcare checks. So each week we are now well over $150,000. I don't know how much CARES Act money, but I worked with somebody who used to say, didn't we spend that grant money last week? And you're saying we're going to spend that grant money again this week, but this is something different. Um, it's, it seems, and I, I am all about, you know, making sure we're safe, but I think we're also um, perhaps not being as fiscally responsible as we could be. I think $300 a door for lock sounds pretty expensive to me. Um, when the safety concern is that you just need to turn it from the inside if it's a shooter problem, not that you need um, Fort Knox. So um, I, I also am concerned and came to this meeting concerned about some of the expenditures we're doing. Um, thanks, Chris, before I give it to you, uh, Floor. So the, the finance committee did review this at our last meeting and they were going to come back to us with some extra, we felt like they, even though there had been an authorization for us to do, this was related to COVID, to this expense that we wanted to bring it uh, back to the board. I, with my experience in construction right now, I got to tell you that everything is, is coming out higher. There's a lack of builders around. And with the doors, we usually say two to four hours to install uh, a good set of hardware. So just in there, you, you have about $1,800 just in installation. A carpenter, the cheapest carpenter you can get right now is $45 an hour. So I'm not necessarily trying to justify all of it. We, we just wanted to make sure that we were bringing it back. It, it was cons a consensus that Chris, uh, Scott, and I came back at our last meeting saying we wanted to bring it back to the board. Uh, the money is in the capital fund, so it's not necessarily all CARES Act. We we would, if they were, my understanding from our last meeting was if they were solid walls, it would qualify for the CARES Act. So we were hoping to maybe use some of that for the money, for, for that. It, so, you know, it's not an excuse, but so we did, 
we try to go through all of uh, all of the of the lines of how we were going to fund it. So it's not necessarily just counting on 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 the CARES Act. Thanks, Flora. Chris, did you have more? Um, I did not. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, uh, other other board members want to weigh in. Um, I uh, on the question of um, this. Uh, I guess we this estimate fell short by, you know, almost fifty. Well, uh, actually, by more than fifty percent. Um, but the the uh, what Brian was saying about the increase in price and floor you as well. Um, evidently, uh, framing lumber, according to the National Association of Home Builders, um, the cost of framing lumber is up 80% over the same period last year. And this is just part of the incredible wild swings. And in, in, um, after the demand crash came a supply crash, and now demand is recovering, but supply hasn't. It's just, um, it's just a mess. I, I think you know, um, but it needs to, it needs to get done, I think. So I support it. Joe? Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't actually raising my hand. I was just sort of putting my head in my hands a little bit. Um, I, I'm not really sure what, what, how to respond. I, I am concerned about, I did, we, I did hear from uh, at least one member of the public about um, the the previous estimate. So this is, uh, and I'm feeling, I think, like Diane, like maybe uh, didn't ask enough questions the last time around. So I'm I'm just a little, but we're in the middle of it. So I, I'm struggling a little bit with how to how to recommend that we proceed. So so you were doing a Fauci. So I was, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Listen, we Italians have to stick together, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, are we ready for a vote then? I would say Joe has a better arm than Fauci, though. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I, I, you, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> Great. Um, well, someday we'll, we'll get a chance to compare, Joe. Um, anyway, uh, so if you're ready, oh, Diane. So I, I guess my question is, is this a firm quote so that if we vote tonight, because then we're going to be further down that road of, of no return, is there potential that we're going to come back with an additional amount? So I, I mean, I hesitate to vote yes, and then we're going to get another 10, 15, 20,000. It was an official bid um, that the architect solicited. So we do have it in writing as if it was ready for a contract. So at this point, it should be enough. Okay, now I am raising my hand. Okay. <laughs> so what happens if, what would happen if we voted no? What would be the outcome? Uh, the, the outcome is uh, there could be some folks in central office that would have to uh, relocate or work out of home or go back to what we had last year with the uh, rotation uh, the uh, because they're right out there in the uh, right out there in the open uh, that would be one of the things uh, and of course and that all depends on of course uh, you know the, the governor changing the you know the occupancy the occupancy rate can go back up it can go up to hundred you percent know, I don't think they're doing that anytime soon. Uh, there's there's different yeah. there's different uh, uh, you know obviously it depends on how pat how if the virus comes back if it doesn't come back uh, the other piece is though is if you go back to the safety piece of someone entering the building uh, during a, uh, a, 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 a like an active shooter type of situation those folks uh, that are are out that are sitting in that that area out there are um, you know sitting ducks in some ways um, so. That's another piece to it. Thanks, Ryan. Lindy, and then Diane. Um, how many people are in that outside area now? Is it two? Two. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm also wondering why a local 
carpenter couldn't build partitions. Um, as far as the active shooter, they are in a position where there are lock rooms with locks right next to them within like two jumps um, mm -hmm. to get into a room and be in place with a locked door. So I'm not as concerned about them having a locking door as just a physical barrier between them for the droplets coming out. Um, and so that is a little bit of my concern as we're doing permanent. I just keep thinking about so much of this permanent and then come December, everything's put in storage. All this equipment, all of this stuff we're spending money on is going to be over and done because I have that kind of attitude that this is all going to be, we aren't going to live this way the rest of our lives. Um, but Hopefully. <laughs> those the two people there everyone else in that building has individual rooms so i just i can see where a partition could be of uh, could work uh, diane so i guess a clarification i thought it was going to be plexiglass so i thought that we had um, talked about and what was described was that it was going to be a plexiglass because we we expressed concern over closing in the interior as people went in. So again, I, I'm just very confused as to where we how we got yeah. here. So so the plexiglass is phase one. So well, when you walk into the building, you'll have you'll have a uh, if you walk in to your left and right, you'll have plexiglass in there. Uh, that's that's that was phase one. Okay, thanks, Fleur. So we, we can't hear you. Sorry, I apologize for that. This would be an investment. This was a plan that was there before. These partitions were never built before, so it won't have a ceiling. So it's the back side of the of the of the office. So not not every. I, I think they have too many people right now. If I'm not wrong, at at central office. So there's two people. Even the filing. So it's something that for years we've been saying that we you know, that we might do, and now it made sense. So the drawings were there from from before, it just never got built. And I'm talking just about the back, so the second phase, not not the first phase. Chris, are you signaling? I, I am. Um, Scott, the, uh, Brian, can you clarify, the locks are for more than the new doors. It's for doors that are already in existence that don't have locks on them, is that right? As of right now, the only door that has a lock is my is my office. Um, and okay, so, so, so basically beyond the new the new doors. Uh, and um, I guess if I was in an active shooter situation, I wouldn't want to be taking a skip or two anywhere. Um, I'd want to be locking my door, even though I still think these locks are really expensive. Um, Thanks, Chris. Scott, um, this is Steve Look. Please, Stephen. And I apologize, my camera's off too because of funky stuff. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to summarize, and um, I think I'm known as a fiscally conservative member of the board. Um, I think the administration needs to hear, and I suspect they've heard very clearly, that if you want money, bring a solid plan um, it would, and I know there's a rush, but it would still be preferable to have some kind of a blueprint or a sketch in a plan and a little more detail. Um, but um, the other thing I'll bring up is we're dealing with multi-million dollar budgets and hundreds of thousands of dollars for COVID. And, you know, for me, um, five thousand dollars for locks. I think the administration has heard we want to be smart with our money and not waste it. And this seems like a lot, but I think we can just vote and move on. Uh, are you calling the question then, Stephen? Here, I'll call it. Okay. So the question has been called. Um, we are moving to a vote. All in favor, please click yes. 
If you're opposed, Scott, please, Scott no. this is this is a vote on calling the question. No, uh, the, the, the question has been called. So we go. This is a vote on the motion, as um, as Fleur moved and you uh, seconded, to authorize the superintendent to spend a total of forty three point three thousand for the central office renovations. Unless, um, uh, so um, here's where my Robert's rules is a little hazy. Um, if you call the question, that is, that closes debate. Um, it would take, I think, a two thirds majority of board members to keep debate going. And if we didn't call the question and just decided to take a vote, would we avoid a vote on two thirds? No, no. Um, we. Uh, this is. This is. Uh, sorry. I'm. I'm... Can, can I? Can I offer some understanding? Of course. By all so. Means. So my understanding is a motion to call is a non-debatable motion, and it requires two thirds approval to pass. It passes and the debate is closed. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, ay, ay, ay. Um, it's a learning process. All in favor of calling the question and moving to a um, <clears throat> to a vote, please click yes. If you're opposed, click no. Great. Um, that uh, question has been called. So now all in favor of authorizing the superintendent to spend a total of 43,300 for the central office renovations, please click yes. If opposed, click no. I have um, seven in favor and one opposed. Um, no, wait a minute. I have, uh, there are more. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight in favor. One, two, three opposed. Did I get that right? Okay, eight to three in favor. So the motion carries. So um, thank you, everyone. Um, now, back to where we were uh, at 4.1.2. Um, since we're still kind of in the same zone, um, Jonas, would you like to, uh, would you like to just kick it off? That would be. Two? I, I would be happy to. Um, so this is a, a, you know, a couple of parts to this question about notifications and communications. Um, so who will be responsible for communicating public health information and updates to school communities? Um, and uh, are those communications planned daily or weekly or ad hoc as necessary? And I'll, I'll, I'll mention a little background about this. Um, the the daycare where we send our three-year-old sends um, updates each time uh, you know a member of the school community is ill for whatever reason uh, to give you know people you know information about you know how much illness there is going around and updates on the status of COVID tests and that's been extremely helpful for us you know making decisions each day about whether to send our our, our three-year-old there. Um, so, you know, will school communities be, will be notified of illnesses and absences without identifying those who are ill, regardless of the known COVID status of those who are ill? And will st school communities be notified of the status of COVID tests of students and staff when they occur? Uh, thank you for your question, Jonas. Uh, I know uh, we, the COVID coordinator and I have been discussing this uh, uh, this uh, and there's uh, definitely a lot of information around this. Uh, do you want to uh, uh, take this first, Elizabeth? 
I'm sorry. I didn't hear the question. My son was. Uh, well, I think the, the question is who will be responsible for communicating public health information and updates to school communities? Are those communications planned daily, weekly, ad hoc as necessary? And, uh, and Jonas had provided a um, uh, up, uh, basically saying that his daycare sends updates about the number of folks in the school community who may be sick and also any updates on the status of uh, anyone who has COVID or uh, COVID decisions. Is that correct, Jonas? Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you did, sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure that we'll have updates, but I don't, I'm don't. i not sure that we will be updating daily on numbers of children who are sick in the building. Is that what you're talking about? You know, like- It, it, it is. Illness? It, it is, uh, you know, as, as a parent, if, you know, because there's no testing and because the incubation period could be up to two weeks, knowing, you know, that there is someone who is, you know, that there's someone in the classroom or in the building who has COVID-like symptoms is an important piece of information for parents who may be making day-to-day -day decisions about whether it's safe for their child to attend school. Well, I suppose, you know, and there's so many symptoms that are COVID-like. I mean, just about everything is. So we will be, we will be paying close attention to that, and I think um, how can I put it? They, um, you know, we have similar protocols for anything like say, say we have an outbreak of strep. We always we will notify a class if there's a certain number, you know, um, and the COVID symptoms. I don't believe we're gonna, you know, I don't know. We could we could talk about it, and I'll talk about it with Brian as far as what kind of information makes sense, you know? Um, and if we have like, I mean, it, even in a flu epidemic, if there's a certain percentage of kids out, then that's, that's something we, we haven't had to do that, but we would consider closing the school, you know? So I think that, does that make sense? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. And a daycare is a smaller operation than a school as well. So, um, and I also think that there could be a, a challenge if a chi if a child is out with COVID-like symptoms and we send something home. Uh, there, we have to be careful of not violating there's HIPAA laws, right? There's private, and folks are going to know who's out, right? If it's, it's in, in certain classrooms, hey, uh, Bobby's not in today, and my mom just got a letter that uh, someone has COVID-like symptoms. It may not be. Uh, it may be a uh, what do you call it? Counterproductive. Uh, I know it may end up uh, hurting hurting, a, a, it may be a false, a false report that, and we don't want to get people nervous. I think the idea is uh, if someone does have COVID, uh, you know, I, I think then that's really where we need to work with the Department of Health as well and talk about, uh, are we shutting down the school? Are we quarantining that pod in the building? Are we shutting that? I mean, I mean, I, I really, those are the types of decisions that we're going to have to uh, coordinate with the Department of Health. I, I understand that, but it's, sorry, Jill, just one follow up. It, it, you know, it does, you know, because there is no testing, you know, we are going to know if there's an active case when someone has active, you know, it's when someone is symptomatic, right, and has gotten a COVID test and it has come back positive. Um, and there's no way to know, you know, how long that person, you know, in, in that event, if, how long that person has been, you know, circulating in the school building and, you know, you know what, what has happened since then. As a, as, as a parent, I would hope that there, you know, obviously you have to balance competing interests, but I think more information um, is better than less information. Yep. Well, uh, I had my meeting tomorrow. It's a good question to also ask uh, uh, for, for uh, it's a good question to also ask tomorrow as well with uh, uh, my weekly meeting with the secretary. Thanks, Joe. Um, I, I just wanted to say that I, I think the question I'm, I'm hearing you ask, Jonas, is really like, what is the communication going to look like? And so I just hope that, that Brian and, and Elizabeth will just take away that broader question, because I think I'm hearing you say you're going to need to make a de you know, decisions, maybe even on a day to day basis. And so how how will that communication be? It sounds like you have an example from a obviously a much smaller place probably than a, than a school that maybe would just be instructive to share. You know, my, my observation of anxious people is that they do better with more information. Like, I think everybody's gonna be plenty scared. So um, I don't think we have to worry about scaring people. <laughs> I'm not especially worried about that. I'm, I'm more actually worried about not giving, giving people 
uh, the impression that or making sure people understand that they're getting all the information they need to make their individual yep. decisions um, for their families. I think that will be more reassuring. So, so I think it's a, just a broader communication question. So, I mean, the two questions I got out of this, uh, this, this, converse, this particular conversation is what will communication look like if someone is sick with COVID and what notification will be given and how will it be given, right? Not just with COVID, I don't think, I think I heard Jonah saying not just with COVID, but with even symptoms. So just a sense of the, and that's, that's where I think there, it does become sort of technically challenging or operationally challenging, but it sounds like at his daycare, they're saying, you know, just some, this number of kids are sick. And, um, and then Jonas can say, wow, five kids are sick. I think I'm kind of done for today. Or, well, one kid is sick. Well, you know, who knows? Maybe it's allergies. Mm -hmm. Chris, are you, are you signaling? Speak for you, Jonas. I just, I was just trying to, I don't know. I just, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Chris? Yeah, Scott. Um, yes. So I have um, a couple questions. Uh, one is kind of um, circling back to the idea as to whether um, remote learning students can participate uh, with other students, like in outdoor activities, um, at the, at the uh, elementary schools. Um, it seems to me that we have a policy that opens up extracurricular activities in school to homeschoolers, um, statutorily endorsed uh, policy, um, and why that wouldn't um, also apply to remote learning students um, who essentially have the same type of um, uh, school students do um, is not clear to me. And the second, uh, I understood from Jen Miller Arsenault's uh, recitation that it was basically a health based issue. Uh, but then I hear, and sorry, Stephen, for picking on you this way, Stephen Dellinger Pate talking about the pods at U32 um, being 15, but you know what? Not strictly 15 because people don't want to be stuck with the same 15 people all the time. So, you know, I guess there's a health concern, but not a strict one. And it seems to me that if we're still trying to maintain um, social relationships and um, unity amongst our students, because there's still all our students in the same school and eventually we'll be together again because the COVID won't last forever, that we should seriously rethink uh, any exclusion of the remote learning students from participating in the activities that they can. Um, and not use, you know, not use the pod system as an excuse not to do that. And then the second question I have, and it's kind of along the same lines, is um, I, I'm not clear why the seventh and eighth graders um, who fall within the um, age, as I understand the, the new studies, the age vulnerability that older high school students have, why they would be in school and not alternate week by week, similar to um, the ninth and 10th graders and the 11th and 12th graders uh, in the middle school. It just, it seems inconsistent, particularly since they're in the same school. And I know the governance is that, or the guidance is that K through eight, um, but when it's a different school building physically, it seems like it would be more consistent to have uh, seventh and eighth reflecting what the high schoolers are doing. Um, thanks. Well, it's Stephen. <laughs> you want me to take that one, Brian? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so uh, first, uh, Chris, I, I hope I didn't mischaracterize the teams and the pods. Kids are going to be in the same 15 student group um, um, exclusively unless we decide to move them within the 60 student group. Um, and that's not going to happen on a daily basis, probably not even on a weekly basis. So I, I, that probably needs to be explained better when I write it out. Um, but the other part is that um, when we des we're designing our 60 student uh, teams to be exclusive um, from other parts of the, of the building. So our seventh and eighth graders are not going to interact with each other. The teams are not going to interact and the teachers are not going to interact either. Um, and so, um, so we're going to have those designed so that they're apart from the high school entirely. Um, but speaking to the, the need to... Um, 
to keep those students uh, in, in a hybrid system versus being there all day. Um, you know, there are four things, there are four things that uh, that's recommended to, to reduce the spread of the virus within a school. Uh, the face coverings, the physical distancing, um, having pods and groups, and then uh, hand washing, hand hygiene. If you do those four things, then you greatly reduce the potential of any kind of spread within your school. And so we think that given the numbers in our classes, we're gonna be able to provide the physical distancing. We're gonna you know, work on having the masks. That's, that's that big push for everybody is to wear masks on a regular basis. And, and we're gonna really enforce that. And then, um, and then the pods themselves really keep kids separate from uh, a larger group of kids um, overall. And so we feel like by having the high school in a hybrid system, we can spread out our middle school enough as well to be able to provide that physical distancing piece. And so that kind of all four of those things together will greatly reduce the possibility that they're spread, not just with middle schoolers, but with high schoolers. And, and it would work, it works for elementary as well. Um, so we think that we we're meeting all those requirements and that we can with those kids there every day. Okay, so the high school will be alter the, the hybrid for the high schools to create space in the middle that schoolers? Is the, yes, I would say that that is the primary reason that we're on a hybrid system with the high school is just to be able to provide for the physical distancing and and just I would say logistics of getting meals to classrooms at lunchtime and doing there's a lot of other logistics that go along with you know what we're going to have to do that we haven't even touched on yet um, and that just having two-thirds of the kids in the building makes that a lot more manageable um, during this time of COVID because you got to remember we're closing our cafeteria we're going to have to actually have bathroom times for classes and things like that because we don't have that many bathrooms in the building um, and they're going to be need to be cleaned, you know, during the day at least at least once or twice. And so there's things like that that have to occur. And just having everyone in the building makes those things much more uh, difficult. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, other board member questions. Jonas. Um, so I've got uh, some questions, uh, uh, Brian, under my my education section. Um, uh, if an in-person student uh, is sick with COVID or any other illness, uh, will they be allowed to participate in remote learning that day? That day, uh, if they're if they're, if they're sick, with, if, if, if they're, they're absent, oh, if they're absent, uh, I mean, I think uh, if if uh, we're going to have to make decisions if a child or or a group of children have to be quarantined and they're not allowed to come to school because there was an illness and we had to shut down either a wing or a part of the building, they would have to, we would have to definitely uh, move into remote learning so the uh, children do not miss their work. No, I'm saying, you know, one kid has, you know, strep or the sniffles, right, and doesn't come to school. Is that kid absent for the day or do they have an opportunity for remote learning? Uh, they would be sick for the day if they're, and they would have to, you know, be treated as if they're out for that day. And uh, if, if, uh, if it's a COVID situation and we have to quarantine, then the children would have to go up. If, if, even if they're not sick, but the whole class has to go home, for, for a certain period of time, then they would go. They could go on remote learning. But if it's a, a student who has a sick, an illness for a day, uh, you know, we're not, we're, I would not. Uh, if you're sick for, if you're sick, you really shouldn't be doing anything, right? So, um, no. The answer is no. They shouldn't be doing remote learning if they're sick. Okay. Chris, did I see you? Um... You're muted. Okay. I didn't. I didn't put my hand down. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, Lindy. That last question from Chris just made me um, want to clarify: the children whose families decide on remote learning, they will be in their own cohort. Is that correct? Such that you wouldn't just have a sick child join that class because there's already a plan going on for that cohort. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Thanks. It, um, if I might recognize myself, I guess, for a question. Um, it, it seems, well, there's this uh, teacher movement um, called Refuse to Return that seems to have started out in California. And one of their criteria for returning is 
that there would be zero cases of COVID for the county in which they're located over a period of two weeks. And um, in Washington County, Vermont, over the past two weeks, um, there's been something like two to four uh, cases of COVID um, confirmed with very low positivity, test positivity rates. Um, it is entirely possible to meet that zero cases for two weeks if the community is all on board. And um, we tend to look inward at ourselves as an organization, but um, has any thought been given to what we can do, what different things we can do in order to, um, instead, of, instead of basing our actions and basing the communities, community members, mask discipline and distancing, et cetera, on fear to um, turn it into something that's based on solidarity, on, on self-respect and respect for others and, um, and so forth, knowing that if they act responsibly and effectively, that this will allow schools to operate and everything else that will fall into place thereafter. Um, has, uh, I know you've got so much on your plates, but um, have you thought about how we can do that? It sounds like kind of a board thing, at least in part, but um, interested in ideas, not necessarily tonight, but um, Jill. Scott, um, the, the Department of Health actually has a whole um, masks on uh, uh, public health campaign. It's a huge promotion. I just had my picture taken for it today. Um, so I, th I think uh, as a healthcare leader, so I actually think that that is really important work, but I don't think it's work that uh, that we need to do as a board or as a um, as a uh, an administrative team, other than perhaps looking into the, you know, the materials and maybe wanting to promote it. But I. I I think that work is being done in other quarters um, on the broad, that broader sort of public health basis. Okay, thanks. Um, Lindy. Mm -hmm. You, I mean, just from what Jill said and thinking about it, because I agree with her, um, if you wanted to jazz up the COVID website, you might put some pictures of our administrators with their masks, modeling their masks or something like that, just showing that we're doing it and what Kat presented tonight also has a lot to do with mindset and that positivity. I think what you just said, Scott, is so important that we're looking at the positives of what Vermont is doing and not comparing ourselves to states who are in a huge uptick and forcing everyone back in a school at the same time, um, trying to have that outlook of trust that the schools are doing the best they can and we're trying and watching the data. Um, Washington County has had very low positivity rates and having a little of that compassion and positivity, but maybe jazz up the website with some mask pictures, I don't know. The power of art, yes. Um, Jonas. Um, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I believe there have been seven new cases and one death in Washington County in the last seven days. Thank you for for the darker side of things. Well, I mean, I mean, no, no, no. I'm, I, I mean, I will continue down the darker side. I mean, we, <laughs> I mean, we are here. If if we're going to go into discussion instead of Q and A. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I, if it can, if, if opening schools full time five days a week can happen anywhere, it's here in Washington County, even with those, you know, a case a day over the last week, uh, we've been, you know, extremely fortunate. Um, but as Branch Rickey said, luck is the residue of design. Um, and Vermont has handled this very well. Our citizens have been extremely responsible. Um, 
we also have the benefit of seeing what is happening in other states um, uh, that have not done as well as we have, but that are opening that, you know, their school year normally opens earlier than ours do. Um, and the early returns from Georgia and Indiana are not great. Um, what I am most concerned about is that since early March um, uh, in Vermont, there have been virtually zero significant, you know, gatherings of significant numbers of people inside. On September 8th, there are going to be hundreds of locations across the state where dozens or hundreds of people will be inside together, you know, seven or more hours a day, two to five days a week. Um, we are, you know, there's nothing magical about Vermont. There's nothing special about us. Um, it, it, it can happen. And I think that we have, in addition to the responsibility, you know, the, the educational responsibility we have to our children, we also have a public health responsibility. Um, and I've, you know, I've, you know, I'm glad that the administer, you know, I'm glad, Brian, thank you for answering all these questions. Everybody, thank you for, you know, sitting, you know, and listening to me go on and on about this. Um, but there is a pandemic going on out there. Um, we do not have closed borders in Vermont. Um, and I, you know, you know, without being too dire, you know, um, you know, it's not a matter of time, but there is significant risk out there. And opening schools is going to increase that risk profile. Um, so yes, you know, there, there's good news and there are things to celebrate, but we also need to take a, you know, a sober look at what the implications are. You know, I would be very interested to know, um, you know, you know the, the people at the state uh, who are doing the modeling uh, around COVID-19, I would be interested to know what their modeling says about the reopening of schools and what the different levels of, you know, m you know future casting are for, you know, schools remaining closed versus a one day hybrid model or a two day hybrid model versus, you know, opening up full time. I think we, we need to confront this stuff. If I may, Jonas, first of all, your Branch Rickey reference wins quote of the meeting award for tonight. That was for you. Um, yeah. Um, also, there's the um, if you if you follow the um, as obsessively as some of us do the um, the graphs of uh, incidents of disease in Vermont, um, there tends to be uh, a, those blips that have happened since May, um, upward blips, tend to follow by about two weeks um, such events as Memorial Day or um, the last week of school or um, 4th of July. And the one concern that, that I have is about Labor Day weekend. There's clearly a lot of mixing going on. Um, people may be getting together with relatives, with friends, sort of the last hurrah for the summer, um, and then back to school. Um, without, you know, without a, a testing protocol or, um, or a, a kind of, uh, you know, soft entry, if you want to call it that, that allows for um, any cases that might have been um, acquired to show themselves. So anyway, that, that's, uh, that too is a concern. Jump in board members if you care to, unless you're tired. We can, we can call this at 9.30, this particular section um, of, the, of the meeting, if you like, unless you're done now. Jonas. I have more questions. Go. I have a question too, Jonas. If... Go, go ahead, John, I'm sorry. Okay, it's okay. Um, sorry, I'm trying to eat dinner and be in this meeting. Um, so I wanna actually go off of what of Jonas's first question, um, and maybe this was discussed, maybe I missed it, but um, you know, I got tested for COVID and it took 14 days to get the results. And so I'm concerned again, like if a child has a scratchy throat or something and they have to go home to home until their test results come back, are they just going to be absent from school or are they going to be able to be incorporated into remote learning? Because 
I didn't feel it sounded like they would just be absent um, until they were either healthy or the re test results came back. Um, so I just needed more clarity on that. Yeah, uh, currently, uh, JL, we were, we, were, we were looking at that, and that's a great question. Uh, and I would like to explore that further with, with, our, uh, with the leadership team. Uh, when I meet when we meet tomorrow, but I, I, I or currently the answer was if the child has to go home, uh, if he's sick, if the child goes home sick, you know they they would uh would not be participating in remote learning because they're at home sick. But I think if you're saying if um, if uh, if a student tests po uh, po test positive for COVID, but maybe it's asymptomatic, what would happen? Is that is that the question? No, if the student goes home with a scratchy throat and then goes to get tested for COVID, but doesn't get the results for 14 days, what is that student supposed to do be yes. during that time? Yes. I mean, because the, the symptoms can be very mild, um, but they stay, still may be contagious. So, I mean, I send my kids to school with runny noses because they're fine. They can still run around, but that was pre-COVID. Um, so, you know, do they have to sit at home and do nothing for two weeks just because they have a runny nose? Uh, mm -hmm. do, Elizabeth, do you have a uh, comment on that? Yeah, I, I think one thing is that if somebody goes home with a scratchy throat and they check in with their health provider, probably they're not gonna get a COVID test, but they might be monitored. And if they don't have a fever and the sore throat goes away, they can come back to school. Um, I, I think that there is, a, is some um, allowance for kids who, in that situation, if they did stay home longer and they were asymptomatic or they got a positive COVID test and they were still asymptomatic, they weren't sick, then there is some allowance for doing some remote work with their own class, the class that's in person. And it's similar to if somebody's out for a period of time and needs to make up work, but they could perhaps, they wouldn't join the remote group. I don't believe. I think they'd still be part of their class, but yeah, they wouldn't be joining the remote learning. The, the group yeah. that's already doing full time now. No, so they'd still be part of their class, and 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 that teacher would be able to work with them and figure out what how they would participate to not fall behind. You know, so I think there has to be some allowance for kids who may need to be out of school, like you said, not really sick, but um, we're asking them not to come. And they shouldn't have to miss. Yeah, Brian, I could add to that from U32's perspective is um, so the way as we've been talking about these teams of kids, the 60 kids, we're assigning all kids, whether they're remote or uh, in person to one of those teams. So those groups of six to seven teachers are going to be working with that group of 60 kids. If some of them are remote, um, by choice of their families, we're building that into the teacher's schedule as part of their day um, to work with those kids. And that way, um, because we know that there's going to be these issues where if a kid ends up being quarantined for 14 days um, because of this, we want them just to be getting the same information as their classmates and being able to participate as much as possible. I mean, if they're actually sick, then they probably won't be able to do their schoolwork, but as much as possible. And I would also say that um, we haven't spoken much about this, but uh, one of the other big things is we're putting in place is a learning management system. And um, I yeah. cannot speak as the expert on that yet. I have other people who are, are becoming experts on that as we speak. Um, but what that will do, do is allow our students, and that's pre-kindergarten through 12th grade, um, that they're going to be able to, to access lessons from their classroom on the learning management system. And so, um, so I don't know exactly how it will look yet, but I can tell you that we are trying to create some, um, some better systems than we had back when we went into remote learning in the spring so that kids have quicker access and families have easier access through one portal to be able to get what school work all of their kids, no matter which grade level they are in. Um, they would be able to see that information for all their kids. And so we recognize the need for you know, kids to be out um, sick and we're gonna try to plan around that. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Chris, and then Jonas for the last word. So Tom, my question is, is there any um, situation in which 
uh, the district can require um, a student or a staff member who is exhibiting what seems to be COVID-like symptoms to undergo a test before returning to any of the schools. Let me to answer that. Yes, please. I, I don't. I don't believe that we can force anybody to have a test, but we can say that you need to check in with your healthcare provider, and that person makes that decision. You know, in conjunction with them, and it can be a team kind of approach. The school nurse can be in touch with the healthcare provider. Um, but if, but if they refuse to go and say, if I say, say, I'm not going to go to my healthcare provider. Is there any protocol that would a require um, assurance from a healthcare provider before someone returns to to the um, the school. That's a good question. I I don't think we've thought about that in exactly that way. Um, but I don't think we can. And if if somebody goes home because they have one of the symptoms or they've made that checklist and they did, you know, there was some reason that they needed to go home or be excluded. And you're talking more about staff, right? Um, uh, staff or, or student. Either okay. one, staff yep. or student, just um, basically a member of the population, right? whoever it is. Right. right. I mean, if we're concerned about a particular student, especially, and we can contact the healthcare provider and, and have them, you know, have, have that student be seen. I mean, we can, we can, say that in order to come back, we could do that. As far as adults, that's a little bit different. Um, but if, if somebody has symptoms, I don't think we can require that somebody um, sees, a, sees their provider before coming, if, as long as they have no more symptoms, if they're better in a day. Um, but if they do have, see a healthcare provider who says you need to have a test, then we, we would have them excluded until they have the result from that test. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks. Jonas, would you like to um, play us out? Um, well, Scott, it's hard to know which tune to play. Um, I had a long set list written up. Um, so I think I'll ask the most uh, uncomfortable one. Um, how will we deal with um, mask and um, distancing non-compliance. And in a similar vein, um, will, you know, will we require COVID vaccinations if and when one becomes available? So, so to uh, answer your question, the first, the last one uh, first, Will we require COVID-19 vaccinations? Uh, we're gonna have to wait for uh, guidance from the uh, state. The state will end up ultimately, I, I believe, imagine setting that uh, because it's a vaccination. Uh, usually the most vaccination uh, laws and requirements come from the state Department of Health. Uh, and I just wanna make sure uh, that is correct. Uh, the I, I believe that is, but I just wanted to make sure. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have anything else to add about the vaccination piece? That's correct. I, I don't think we can, insist that you know i mean even regular immunizations we can't insist if somebody wants an exemption they they can have a religious exemption and not have a vaccination and they can't be excluded but um you know it would be it's a state mandate it's not our mandate about vaccinations yep uh and the other question jonas that you asked is how will we address mask and distancing non-compliance yes uh so i, I know uh uh cat uh, uh Cat, Cat Fair talked about the uh, trying to, you know, when kids are coming back and we definitely, uh, we, we have all these options of discipline, right? To uh, discipline a child when they're not doing something and it's being non-compliant. I think the first thing is we need to find out why they're being non-compliant and find out what is happening. Uh, but if it's uh, just someone um, not following it because they, they, they think they don't have to and they're, there's, and we and we're, we work with their families to try to let them know that, uh, you know, your child's not complying, here's what could happen. Ultimately, I think we have to be prepared to uh, uh, tell the family and the child that you might have to be, you may have to be on remote learning. Uh, 
Carl. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. Great. I, I know that. Um, sorry, Jonas. Yeah. Um, can't hear. I'd love to fit in just one more. Just okay, one more. Is this? Sure. Thank you. Um, so this is about the the separation of uh, kids into in person and remote cohorts. And it seems like there will be a wall and um, uh, I, I haven't seen any, any opportunities for, you know, for cross engagement there. Um, so, you know, in the event that you know, I think, forget who said it earlier that this is not what we're gonna be doing for, I think it was Lindy uh, said that we're not gonna be doing this forever. We won't have this pandemic forever. Um, if that is the case, and I certainly hope it is, um, how will the existing, you know, in-person class cohorts maintain contact and cohesion um, if some are remote uh, in classrooms which they don't know uh, and some are in person. Um, and the last, uh, I, the, the last piece of this is, will grading be comparable for in-person versus remote cohorts? So uh, the answer to your last question is yes. And I can have Jen talk more about that. Well, I know uh, she's on the C, uh, CIA Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Task Force. Uh, Jen, can you? Uh, Please respond to that. Yeah, sure. So the standards, the performance indicators, the rubrics, the you know the criteria, the proficiency skills, they are all the same, whether a student is in remote learning or they're learning in person. Um, Stephen had mentioned the learning management system earlier, Canvas. We did a lot of uh, research this summer as the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Task Force to figure out a learning management system that was gonna allow us to customize so that we could continue to implement proficiency-based learning principles and so that we could customize so that the interfaces were developmentally appropriate. It also allows us to having one system pre-K through graduation to streamline our communication with families and students, which we heard a lot of feedback about uh, as, a, as room for improvement in the spring. And, um, and it allows us to collaborate with teachers as well. In terms of your earlier question, I guess I'd answer that in two ways. One thing is that we're currently envisioning the remote learning cohorts to be comprised of students in similar grades or grade level clusters of elementary from across all of our schools. And just like we spend the first you know, six weeks of school in a responsive classroom model, building community and articulating expectations, we would envision doing the same thing so that that becomes a robust learning community as well. That, you know, third grade cohort from across all of the schools. So that there will be a lot of intentionality and community building um, and expectation understanding there. And we have been hearing questions about, well, and how can I also maintain a connection to the broader school? And the principals have been talking about that, right? To the extent that there might be an event or some sort of a virtual exchange, those sorts of things. We do not have all of the details ironed out, but it is definitely something that we're all thinking about so that um, one day when kids can all be back in person, we will have preserved those relationships as well. Thank you, Jen. Um, wonderful. Um, thank you, everyone. Scott, uh, just one, just, I'm very sorry, Scott. Okay. Just one, one more. <laughs> the topics that I, that I haven't gotten to address and that I hope that we will have an opportunity to do as a board um, to ask, to continue to ask these questions are about the, uh, the balancing act that uh, the, in the decision-making between, um, you know, the, uh, the deleterious effects of, you know, remote learning, part-time remote learning, how those effects stack up, you know, the more time a child spends out of the class and how we're balancing that against public health. Um, also uh, more about, you know, the mechanics of how quarantine um, in, you know, and isolation in schools should a kid become sick, how that happens. I have more questions about the resilience of the system, um, where the pain points are here. Um, and particularly around how we will know each day if we have enough staff on hand uh, to operate each school, um, you know, given the, uh, you know, what we approved last week in terms of letting uh, their kids come either as uh, uh, enrolled students or in their remote learning pods. Thank you for bearing with me. I appreciate everyone's patience. Of course. Thank you, Jonas. It's a good illustration of just how fiendishly complicated this whole business is. Um, 
So uh, I, I hope it's with some sense of relief that we move on to um, the fairly simple and straightforward part of the meeting, which is the consent agenda. Would anyone care to move to approve the minutes of July 15th and July 22nd, beginning on page eight? This is Diane, I so move. Thank you, Diane. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, I'll Flora. Um, <laughs> thanks, Jael and, and Jill, um, as backups. Um, any, any changes to the minutes? Any questions? Scott, I have a minor one. It's Jill. Sure, Jill. Um, it, uh, Lisa, it looked to me like in the minutes of July 22nd, um, my name is spelled correctly in the part up top where it lists who was present, but in the body of the minutes, it's spelled uh, Olson with an E-N. It should be Olson with an O-N. Yeah. Got that, Lisa? And Chris, I see your hand up. Um, I think you need to unmute, Chris. Um, oh, okay. It was up from before. I just didn't unraise it. Thank you. Oh, okay. Great. All right. So um, if we're ready then to vote on the minutes of July 15th and July 22nd, please click yes if you approve and no if you disapprove. And I'm seeing all the yeses. Um, Jael, you're good? Yeah, I just accidentally hit that, the hand. Oh, oh okay, great. Great, okay, um, minutes are approved. Now, uh, motion to approve the board orders, whoever has them handy, please um, feel free to read them out. I will do so. Uh, I move that we approve uh, the board orders in the amount of $180,213.21, and $8,812.18. Excellent. Thank you, Jonas. Is there a second? Floor seconds. Great. Uh, are there questions about the board orders? Um, Lindy, did you have a question? No, I was actually just moving my hair, but I had, <laughs> um, I had uh, sent an email inquiring about the readmission management software because I was a little concerned. I know we were, something was mentioned at our last meeting about some sort of software, but I didn't expect it to be $15,000 for a one year subscription is what it appears to be. So I just wanted to voice that, which I had done earlier, as far as I think some of these COVID expenses have been um, Cadillacs or Mercedes or Audis or something. So I'm just saying. Thanks, Lindy. Um, and uh, I presume you'll receive, you'll receive an email response. H have you received a response already? Oh yes, that's, I um, Googled the company to find out what it was because all it said was the name. Saw it had to do with hospitals, um, minimizing readmission hospital software. I thought when parents were filling out their checklist or whatever, it would be a simple Google sheet or something in our already management student management system or through Google, but not um, a full blown hospital software system. So I was a little surprised. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, other questions about the board orders? All right, all in favor of approving the board orders as moved by Jonas and seconded by Floor, please click yes. If you disapprove, please 
click no. Um, and I'm seeing all yeses. Thank you very much. The motion passes. Um, and as, uh, as I see some of you are already doing, um, please don't forget to send in your email as token of your signature on the board orders. Um, very good. So moving on to 6.0, uh, approve new teachers, et cetera. Um, beginning on page 23, would anyone like to move um, the, in the first place, the hirings? Um, the new teacher nominations. I move that we approve the new teacher nominations. Great. Uh, would you, um, would you For mind Heather, up? Yes, I uh, move that we approve uh, uh, Heather Clark Warner, uh, East Montpelier Pre-K teacher at point four FTE. Kevin Richards, U32 Social Studies teacher at one FTE. Uh, Jessica Abisla, uh, the new Doty School nurse at one FTE. Great, thanks very much. And Do uh, Dorothy, you're seconding? Yes. Thank you very much, okay. Um, is there discussion of these? Thank you for including the, um, the uh, employee nomination forms. If there is no discussion, we can go to a vote. All in favor of approving these teacher nominations, please click yes. If you're opposed, please click no. I'm seeing all yeses. Great, thank you very much. Um, now we also have one change in FTE. Um, would anyone care to move that? I can move it, I have it in front of me. Uh, David Matthews at East Montpelier Nurse increased to a 0.5 FTE to a one of one uh, full-time position. Great. Floor moves. Uh, is there a second? Um, I'll second. Oh, thanks, Dorothy. Um, <clears throat> great. Uh, any further discussion of this? If not, all in favor, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And I'm seeing once again, all yeses. The motion passes. Wonderful. Okay, um, now at this point, we have, yeah, uh, sorry, Brian. Yeah, I, I, oh. I, I didn't wanna, I'm sorry for jumping in. Maybe I should let you talk. I was just making sure we didn't uh, miss uh, the uh, behavior interventionist position. Right, thank you. Um, uh, having jumped from the back to the front again of the agenda, <laughs> I'm reminded that we have um, this 6.2 approving the addition of one behavior interventionist. Um, would anyone care to move this? I'll move. Um, Jaila moves and Dorothy seconds. Sure. Thank you. Very good. So, uh, Brian, um, uh, there's a memo explaining this, but would you like to? Uh, uh, yes, uh, one of our uh, contractors has uh, is uh, no longer going to be providing services uh, at, that we've contracted with, and our uh, our director of special services, Kelly uh, Bushy, uh, has seen has realized a cost savings to the district uh, with uh, being able to hire a behavior interventionist position, which would be a new position. Uh, however, we would be able to pay this position with the contracted uh, service, uh, with the money that we wouldn't be spending on the contract would basically cover this behavior interventionist and also re uh, result in some savings to the district. Uh, Kelly, did I get everything? I just wanted to make sure, is there anything else? Uh, I know uh, you, you uh, worked on this. You got it. <laughs> okay. Great, thanks very much. Any board discussion? or questions. Um, what is the savings to the district? 
It'll be approximately around twenty thousand dollars. Okay, is that and um, is the valuation of the new employee based on a, an average of uh, benefits or conservatively using the family benefit? We Come use the family. Savings. We use the the family benefit. We went high. Okay, thank you. Great. Other questions? If not, then let's go to a vote. All in favor of adding a behavior a behavioral interventionist position, please click yes. Opposed, click no. And once again, I'm seeing all yeses. Great. Thank you, everyone. Now, um, almost there. However, we have at this point public comments. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, Scott, what? I'm sorry. I, we do have, uh, I do have one other piece uh, that uh, came out. Uh, we had a, a resignation recently uh, that oh. uh, someone had resigned after 46 years of service. And uh, Cat Fair wanted to, uh, I, I really wanted to, uh, uh, speak speak up tonight at this section. Absolutely, yes. I'm. We're all ears. So, um, Moni Hudson, Mrs. Hudson, um, has been a paraeducator and classroom assistant at Callis since I was a kid there. Callis. She started just a couple years after I joined Callis. She has lived in Callis her whole life. She's worked in Callis her whole life. Her grandkids, her kids have gone through Callis and U32. This is an end of an era. And it's not, she is, um, it, this is not a position that the board needs to approve or not. She's been ready for retirement. I've just held on to her every year, but this is the year that she's decided to retire. And she did write a nice letter to the board. Do you guys mind a few minutes if I read it? No, okay. please go right ahead. No. So Moni says to the school board after, 46 rewarding years of being with Callis kids, I've decided to graduate to retirement. I started three years after the school was built, been here for all eight principals, seven librarians and countless teachers. I have seen and learned numerous reading and math programs over the years and it's been a learning experience for me as well as the kids. Most rewarding to me has been seeing Callis students become successful adults and it's gratifying to know where they got their start. That part makes me cry. Callis Elementary will always have a place in my heart and it's been a big part of my life for a long time and I treasure my time there. I just wanted us to acknowledge her. That's, that's beautiful, Kat. And um, Moni, you're right, she's an institution. It's impossible to imagine the school without her, actually. Um, and she has like 10 times more energy than I do. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, we wish her our very, very best, and um, I know she'll continue to be a very big part of the community anyway. Um, just hope she stays safe and healthy. Um, so, uh, I have Ryan, a uh, sorry, Fleur? I just want to tell Kat that, tell Moni that I am at the retired college library and she's hosting me because I had no power in my house and she, Moni and Karen are best friends. <laughs> <laughs> so the connections continue. Yeah, that's great. So Brian, is it is it safe now to move to 7.0? Great. All right. Um, 7.0 is public comments part two. Um, so I uh, have public comments at the beginning, um, and no one took us up on the um, on the invitation. Um, for uh, now, if you're on Zoom and wish to make a public comment, I would ask that you kindly click the raise hand button on the, um, the participants um, box. Or if you're uh, in on your phone, I guess if you just, ah, um, Ursula. And Lisa. Oh, you did definitely. This is actually Chris Stanley. Oh, hi, Chris. This been, how are you doing? Good. There's been a lot of really good questions. I know there's a lot of hard work going on. With the community forum on the 19th, is there any way to delay when parents have to make their decision? 
there are way too many open questions, you know, commit by tomorrow, what our kids are doing. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I'm, I'm not, I know the, uh, are we in a position to answer that question at this point? I would, I would just say that uh, we're, we're trying to make this, I mean, I understand the question and uh, it, because it, parents want, want, want as many, I, I, I know uh, Chris, Chris has been reaching out and asking questions and we answer more, we, we've been asking, answering questions. I understand he, he has, a, he's has questions and he's asking great questions. Uh, and it's, a lot of times the questions end up, uh, we end up taking back to our team and and uh, reviewing and uh, trying to be more thoughtful about certain things. So I thank you, Chris, and I thank you, Ursula, uh, for your questions. Can we delay uh, answering those uh, pieces? I would not say we want to delay because we, we do need to have answers. And you know, and I know uh, we're going to continue to send out more information. It's, it's, it's going to continue to come. I think some of these uh, questions that uh, board member, school board members asked today, uh, we're going to definitely have to come back, continue to go back and look at some of these uh, questions that we uh, could not answer today uh, and try to get them out. So I, I think the, the, the instruction, the best way to try to say is try to answer the question as, as what do you call it, as um, well as you can with the, infor the limited information or the information that you have. And uh, the, again, the guiding principle is everything we're trying to do is we're trying to be as flexible as possible. So yes, um, please answer the questions so we can start making decisions on on a, on a, what we're doing. I do recognize though that things on the ground may change as new information comes available. So uh, we have to, we have to be flexible, but we would also really uh, I don't want to say yes you could change it and then all of a sudden 200 parents don't answer questions. I think we really want to have an idea of have parents answer the questions based on the information that they have available. And obviously if things, you know, things change, you know, maybe you want to reach out to your principal and let them know uh, before the start of school. But I, I do think that we do, we are in that area where we're trying to make a, make some decisions, but we are recognizing that we have to be flexible. Thanks, Brian. Um, may we move on to Lisa? And thank you, Chris and Ursula for your question. Hi, um, so first I just wanna thank the board and the administration endlessly for all the work they've been doing. Um, I know everybody is working really hard at a lot of impossible tasks. Um, I am a fifth and sixth grade teacher at Doty as well as a parent of two school-aged children um, also at Doty. Um, I, as a teacher, I've had growing concerns that the collective teacher voice uh, hasn't been amplified to communities, especially um, because at some point all of this moves from discussion and meetings to teachers and staff implementing um, what Scott called earlier a fiendishly complicated system. Um, so I've written a letter to the board that many of you uh, probably have seen as an individual. Um, and also there is a letter in the Worcester Front Porch Forum today signed by 12 Doty teachers expressing um, some of our questions and concerns that haven't been answered yet. Um, but so tonight, like Jonas, I have so many questions and it's hard to choose what to ask or what to comment on, especially as my list has grown tonight. Um, but I'm gonna choose a teacher focused question and ask in that capacity. Um, so earlier, a question was asked about providing more specific information on the website rather than just policy statements. Um, and I'll give the specific example of uh, the claim that you know we're sharing with the community that there will be a robust remote, remote learning experience and, and what that would look like. Um, you know, it was stated that the remote learning survey documents, you know, what this experience will look like. Um, and I have to argue that as a teacher, um, what I find is that the survey lets family know, lets family know the hourly requirements, um, lets them know the tool, which is Canvas, which teachers are yet to be trained on, which will take up a few of our days, as well as social emotional training and protocol training. So those 10 days are getting filled very quickly. Um, and there's a provided schedule that suggests to parents when math might happen or global citizenship might happen. But, um, but what's missing is instructional approaches. And what we know makes a robust learning experience for students is um, high quality instruction strategies and tools and teachers who are equipped to deliver that instruction. Um, I'm a teacher and I know that if we are selected to teach remotely, we'll be asked to add an endorsement to our license, which will require um, 10 credits of coursework over the course of the year. 
but I don't know whether we'll receive any training beforehand or if we are implementing a remote program on the go as we also are trained. Um, and I think these are the kinds of details um, that really are important for families and teachers to be aware of as we, um, as we say that we are ready to implement a robust program. Um, and then, so I think these sentiments ripple through the concerns around all of the information on the website um, in terms of not just having policy documents and, and sentiments, um, as Chris spoke to earlier, but um, you know, even Kat's presentation, which you know, I have so much respect for and, and so many teachers believe that we're trying to make good plans to support students in social emotional learning, but there's so many questions about what this looks like for us as teachers operationally and how much training we'll receive um, in those 10 days and if it's enough. And so um, I don't know what my specific question is, um, but I would like to see more information, specific information for families on that website. Um, and, and if the board or admin wanna speak to my concerns, I would love it, but um, I'll leave it at that for now. Wow, thanks. So so let me, let me summarize, Lisa. Uh, so you would like to see more information and you feel like teachers need to see more information on how uh, some of the things play out operationally, correct? Um, yes, and if there's not more information, then families need to know that. Um, and te you know, teachers need time to plan and be trained. And while I, while I hear that we have 10 days, um, the list of things that we will need to train for in 10 days when our, when our jobs are really gonna look very new for us mm -hmm. um, is, is a little bit overwhelming yeah. for teachers. Yeah, and, and I know, and, uh, and a lot of things are being placed on teachers, I, I, I get that. And then I know it's probably the hardest time to ever be a teacher and a lot of people have not signed up for that, right? I mean, it's just a difficult situation. So I, I, and I, and I thank you for uh, your dedication to your community and for uh, and, and to your and to your profession, uh, the uh, the pieces. Uh, so basically, the, a lot of the times, the uh, uh, the way that we're trying to set up our communication uh, capacity has been the website has been kind of you know not going to get into the minutia of you know it gives you an idea of a lot of the the broader ideas of what we're thinking and how we're going to be implementing and what we're going to be doing. And then I know that the principals typically put out newsletters. Uh, to their communities and uh, they really get into the, a lot of the specific details. I know that uh, uh, it's again it's like an onion you peel off an onion and there's more details that need to be uh, added. Uh, so I, d I definitely would ask you know implore you to talk to your uh, principal uh, and uh, and also uh, if there are certain things that are still require more details uh, we do have folks working on those so for example the instructional approaches I could probably have Jen maybe talk a little bit more about, she's a member of the uh, Curriculum Instruction Assessment Task Force, as, as is, uh, uh, we, I mean, who else, well, I'm trying to think who else is there. Jen, I know Jen has been working with uh, the uh, task force about identifying PD, professional development needs for uh, teachers in regards to implementing the remote learning option. Um, I also think if Alicia is also on that uh, task force as well as an elementary principal, I don't know if any of, any of you want to talk about uh, some of the work that we're working on because I, 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 did, uh, I did see your letter and I thought that there was a lot of questions that you had. Uh, I thought that there was a lot of things that folks have either A, answered or maybe haven't provided out to you directly. And uh, then there's also some questions that we still need to look at, absolutely for sure. So. Uh, Jen or Alicia, do you have anything else to add about um, the uh, student learning, you know, the, the, I know the, uh, about the learning management system and instructional approaches? So I can say a little bit, and then uh, Jody, Alicia, and I have been working yep, on well, the yep. in-service plan together uh, to bring to the rest of the team. But we, the, a subgroup of the curriculum instruction and assessment task force is designing the PD around Canvas using Canvas so that teachers will be familiar and confident with the platform and also embedding in that training, uh, the modeling and the utilization of best practices in remote learning. So it's all sort of coming together in that way. That will be 
that that's some of the answer that you know more extensive training as you mentioned regarding i mean this is a licensed endorsement in in some cases but we are trying to provide that baseline we also want to make sure that in utilizing canvas we're preparing all of our families students and teachers in the event that everybody has to go remote down the line that we all feel confident and competent in our use of that platform so that we can more seamlessly transition to a period of remote learning should that be required. I don't know if Jody or Alicia has anything they want to add to that explanation. As we build our professional development, we've been working to build in best practices, as Jen said, and universal design for learning. So making sure that we remind teachers of the skills that they already have and that their experience and expertise hasn't gone away. We just need to shift how we're using it. And so helping folks to do that. And teachers are designing the PD modules for that work um, in those two weeks. We also are setting aside a great deal of time in the second week to allow for teachers to collaborate and work together, whether it's across schools at the elementary level, at grade level teams, or if it's content alike, pre-K to graduation for my cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, at the high school, working in teams or in course alike uh, to start building those courses in Canvas, which I think will be immensely helpful so that you can divvy up the load, so to speak. Yeah, I think the, the only thing that I would add to that is, um, you know, just thinking about the timeline, we're interviewing for the remote positions next week. Um, and our hope is that, you know, once we've identified who those remote teachers are, we'll, we'll be able to work with them and developing the plans really for what, you know, what more of those specific details look like. We wanted to come up with kind of the framework, but those details have yet to be determined. And we're hoping that the remote teachers will help with that. Many thanks. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I believe the telephone uh, 324-6622 unmuted. Uh, is that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, Hi, Scott. Corinne. Corinne. Hello, Corinne. How are you? So, I'm great. Thank you. Um, hope you guys are all doing okay. At least you don't have a drive home. Um, I did send an email along with this. So I get it that you may not have answers to it. And I will look forward to the frequently asked questions. But some of the things I haven't heard are and I've read as much as I can on the news site and in principals newsletters and so forth, but I have not seen or I missed what the vocational student plans are, what with them going back and forth between two schools. And I haven't heard if staff and substitutes will be working in more than one school. I'm wondering if school photos will be taken as usual. I'm wondering if instead of thinking about using tents at all, if people have thought about having um, at least one large shelter at each school, because besides the expense and the hassle of putting tents up and down, if you own it, you actually have to store it too. Um, and I mean a shelter larger than the one that's currently at BES. And the last thing I want to note is please don't wait to put up the frequently asked questions until you have all the answers. Put it up even if you just have the questions and then people will know that their question has been asked and the answer will be coming and to make sure to date the answers. So if information changes and you need to update an answer based on new information, people will be able to discern what's current information. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Karen. Nice suggestions, thanks. Um, are there are there other public comments? If not, sorry, Scott, I am raising my hand again. Oh, I'm sorry, Lisa. Um, in forgive me. Lead and keep asking a few. Um, <laughs> I am wondering what the process is or the plan is for hiring um, teachers, classroom teachers to fill the positions of those teachers who will be hired to teach remotely 
Um, with the current timeline, as I understand, uh, there's a interview process next week for current classroom teachers who are interested in teaching remotely. Um, so there's going to be a number of jobs to fill across the district in classroom. Um, and so, you know, that leaves about 12 days before the 24th at best um, to hire teachers to fill classroom positions. Um, is there a plan to shift teachers around in the district to fill that? Are we posting for external folks to get those jobs? And just what is the plan for that? Yeah. So I think uh, the preliminary plan, uh, Lisa, is to see uh, operate within our budget, right? So uh, trying trying to I know I heard some bu uh, board members tonight uh, talking about being physically uh, responsible. So uh, we need to see where those teachers are coming from, uh, and then and and also how many uh, students, how many families are opting for the remote option, and how many families are opting for in person. So it's kind of a little bit of a puzzle, but uh, it may involve moving moving some folks around. Thanks, Brian. Um, Lisa, you're, yes? Um, I, I guess I just wanna echo one more time um, from the community, both parent and teacher perspective, some of the unanswered questions about um, testing and protocol for when kids are um, showing any symptoms. I think there was a lot of unanswered questions there. Um, I do really feel like um, as a community member and a teacher, I'm doing my due diligence to read mm -hmm. through all the materials um, and really thinking about the questions that I'm submitting to mm -hmm. administration um, and feel fairly confident that the questions I'm submitting um, have not already been answered in a way that adequately answers my questions. And I think it became very clear that there are a lot of questions about testing and about kids going home and how long they need to stay home um, and how the rest of us who are in the buildings or sending our children to the buildings um, can feel confident. And I, and I heard a lot of the answers were that we need to talk more about that. And I think that needs to take a high level of priority um, for those of us who are deciding on whether to send our children into the buildings or not. So I just wanted to echo that to make sure that um, that is not lost. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, other public comments? If not, 8.0 is future agenda items. We've added a couple today already from uh, business administrators succession and board retreat. Um, are there any others that board members would like to uh, put on the list? Diane. Uh, uh, check in on where we're at for uh, board replacement membership. Good one. Yeah. Any others? Great. Um, if that is the case, then if there is no objection, let's adjourn by consensus at 1012 with thanks and best wishes for a calm and peaceful night. Good night, everyone. Good night, thank you. Good night, thanks.